And game is too easy when Nathan can make it just <laughs> <those> play. Haha, <laughs> 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 funny! Classic right click, it's very good, get it out the game! Uh, yeah, we definitely... <laughs> yeah, we definitely had a party, like a Brazilian steakhouse. We went to Brazilian steakhouse, which was really good. But the way they've said it, that he admits involvement, it makes it sound... And the way everybody read it instantly was like this gone to this guy and be like, Yo, you got any credit cards, Andy? Yeah. I, uh, I got a couple free bits off you? That's f insane. What is up, friends of Valorant? Welcome to episode number 74 of Valoranting, a professional ranting show about Valorant. Of course, I'll be your host today, Van Silly. Why? Because Mitch is gone for the weekend, Las Vegas. I don't know Mitch what the hell he's going to do. Yeah, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? So we have we have a brand new guest or actually a returning guest. First off, I'm back. I'm going to ask the question. Why the fuck are you back here? Because I just read a twit longer, Lini, about you just leaving Valorant earlier today. I mean, I, I just love crab game. I, I think it's the next big eSport. But, you know, sometimes it, it's like, you know, like people that graduate high school. They have to go back to, like, see all the old teachers, see all the old people, everything like that. Sometimes you just have to make that reunion tour. And I guess that's what I'm here for. Already a 10-year reunion for Mimi. But we also have, of course, our regular Mitch Man. Mitch Man, you just came back from the uh, Game Changer Series 2. How has your week been? Oh, it's been pretty good. Just prepping to fly off tomorrow for Red Bull. So got to uh, gotta unpack the cases, clean things, and then pack them again. So it's a cycle. <laughs> the good old life of casting. For sure. But uh, you know what? Before we actually get into the topics, let's go ahead, of course, and plug our socials. We actually like to interact with you guys. So make sure you go over to Twitter.com at Valoranting and, uh, you know, send us your comments, send us your remarks, send us your slurs, whatever it is. We'll, we'll filter them and then we'll bring them on the show whenever we want. <laughs> and then uh, also make sure you guys check out our YouTube on YouTube.com. We have a brand new name, of course. It is forward slash Valoranting. And with that, let's go and let's go and talk about our topics for today. I'm going to put my dog down because he's already making me really, really hot. I have a minute to talk about this. So, of course, really, we have really a hot. new act. We, of course, as usual. Mitch, I only have one minute to talk about this. So let me just have my minute, please. When we come, when we have a new act, we also have new changes. So we'll talk about the new agent coming out, of course, Chambers, and some patch notes that just got announced today. And we will also talk about the EMEA series number two and the LCQ North America, and also bring in a, a great guest. We have Zeta from Cloud Nine that's going to talk about the victories that they got throughout the week. See, it only took me thirty seconds. Daniel told me I had to find a just medium. I speak too fast. Sometimes I can do it in 15. And with that, I'm going to keep talking. We have 20 seconds. And let's stop it right now. Let's talk about the patch notes, Mimi, and also Mitch Man. So to kick things off, we'll talk about Chamber. Whew. I was actually pretty happy when I was watching LCQ and we had the trailers coming out of Chamber. Because that music, although it's not playing right now, was pretty fucking dope. Yeah, it's pretty sick. I think, like... Every time we get a new agent introduction, it just seems like we're stepping it up one level as well. Like there's more lore coming in, there's more graphics. It's just it's more and more epic every single time. I can't wait to see where it ends <laughs> or it never ends. Let's keep going. Yeah, Any I, I feel like on we were that, just like this? watching like a, a James Bond movie intro when we saw. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. I feel like it was about to be like. Burr, 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 burr. I don't even know how the James Bond themes goes, but <laughs> exactly it, it, goes. It, it was fucking. Did you just sick. play it on your mic. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm actually the voice actor for that music uh, as a whole. The so. voice James, actor James for Bond, the music. Okay, I see. Yeah. James Bond has been around since the 70s, and a new one just came out like two weeks ago, and you still don't know how the fucking song goes? <laughs> oh. To be fair, My Vance, you're the only one of us that has also been around <laughs> since the 70s. <laughs> I uh, we're trying to bring our pets on, but sometimes uh, other pets don't like to be uh, picked up, and I yeah. thought that was like the cat remix of the James Bond song, so that was that was actually <laughs> new dope, new but... new song just dropped, and, and it's starting <laughs> off there. I don't know how to remember. So. All right, well, let's talk about the agent more specifically into the abilities because a lot of people are trying to figure out: is this a Sentinels? Is this a, a Duelist agent? What are our thoughts right now as well? We'll talk about the first abilities coming out. It's going to be the trademark ability. If I'm not mistaken, this is actually uh, the teleporter, right? If I'm not mistaken, he puts a, or no, it's actually the, the sentries. Kind of like a mix between a killjoy and a sage. So you place this on the ground. It scans around the area. If it spots you, it shoots you and it slows you in the area. That sounds pretty OP for setting up here on, uh, on anchored sites. Yeah, everybody I just inside. Like you get two. Yes. Like li literally everyone in Lothar's chat has just nailed it, you know, just a better sentinel. That's uh that's all that he is. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I, know. I, I like this. I feel like hmm. 
I, I think it's gonna the value is gonna come from the information more from the slow because the slow mm -hmm. is fine but it, it's like basically you get two free alarm bots you get the info and my question i don't think he has a range on this right you can you can so. place this anywhere and have it so you almost get two kj alarm bots from any distance and the the synergies you have with other agents like if you're playing mm -hmm. a, a second sendy with a molly or even a viper or someone slap a slap a molly into that um slap a molly into that slow field yeah there, there's lots of options with it obviously it's not as good as vulnerable because vulnerable is a stupid dumbass ability that shouldn't be as powerful as it is but uh it's, it's <laughs> pretty interesting it it also looks like you could place it on like higher elevations as well. I I feel that what what's a con about the trademark ability is that you cannot recall it like the alarm bot. So once you place it, it's there and it stay it stays there for the whole round. So at least that's a little plus to look about. But I don't know, man. I, it also feels like you almost can't shoot it out because as soon as it it spots you, it just shoots you and puts that circle down right away. So we'll see. If there's going to be some sort of range for us to be able to spot it to take it down. Uh, I also think that the next ability is actually one that's going to be pretty awesome and expensive, but also maybe not as expensive when it comes down to these eco rounds. These one shot headhunters? That is pretty fucking insane. Yeah. So, just to give you a little bit more details on that, is you, it, it's just a regular skill, but you have to buy bullets, up to eight bullets available, which is only 100 credits going into each bullet. Um, you could aim down the site. It's, it's what? A one shot across the map. Either it's body shot, headshot, so you have pretty much like a mini op into almost every round that you want. Is it uh, only I, headshots? Okay, I think yeah, it's only headshots. Yeah, yeah. But only headshots. E even still, the fact that you know for eight hundred credits you can go in to a pistol round or to an eco round or for less, right? Hey, buy four bullets. Why? Why not? Um, <laughs> and you've got a sheriff that that can one tap on range. It's yeah. really really powerful in the hands of top level players. Uh, in the hands of everybody, rounds, right? Like I mean, you get... not, not even that. You want to peek a super long range angle. Say you're playing back A site and you want to peek all the way down. Well, if you have a phantom, all of a sudden you can play this shit and you've basically got a vandal on range, at least for one taps. And then you can swap to your phantom and take close range fights. It can be uh, really versatile in terms of yeah, the weapon. I, I think from what we saw, it doesn't 145. It's, it's one shot headshot at absolutely any range. And the thing is, mm -hmm. imagine, imagine pistol rounds. I know the classic just got a little nerf, but you get full armor plus a deagle plus uh plus an ability like that's that's amazing that, that's yeah. amazing that he can do that and i i like i kind of want to pull back because i want to ask what, what do you guys think about this as like more of like a, a game design standpoint because because thus far with valorant most of the abilities have been focused on like something that's additive right like a place a piece of utility a flash a tripwire something like this but this is pulling more towards what jet knives are where it's something yeah. that kind of is taking us out of that like tactical shooter core and more of like well it, it still is but it's like more that a specific character can give you a buff in specific fights with weaponry and, and mm -hmm. making eco rounds even more vol volatile and do you mm -hmm. think that that's a good direction for the game Oof, that's, it is that's right a good now. question in, in this exact moment i think so purely because i don't think we can add too much depth too quickly like the the game needs room to breathe and really find its identity with the agents that actually affect gameplay putting an astra in a killjoy these sort of agents drastically affect the way that the game is going to be played and mm. while this one will, it'll be very much centered around more of an individual perspective. When mm. you go to pro teams, it will help in aspects, but it's not going to completely shift the way that they play the game in the way that some of the other agents that came out. So I think agents like KO, like Yoru, and uh, I think to a lesser extent, I think Chamber's going to be more impactful than mm -hmm. either of those two. But still, the point stands that we sort of need these... Uh, the core basis of the game being around your your sentinels and all these kind of guys but as they grow you, you can't overcomplicate the game so you've got to build around it right with these sort of less fleshed out less impactful but still kind of fun to play on an individual mm. level and I, I think he's gonna make some very interesting scenarios keep things fresh but not like change the world or change valorant as we know it i, I think the opposite I think oh. that he could potentially change the world, uh, especially what Mimi was okay. talking about, and like the rounds where you have eco rounds. Because if you have a jet, for example, and she has jet knives, it's gonna take eight ults, all points before she can pop that out or seven, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and, and then she could actually get those swings and those headshots to get those knives refreshed. Um, but if you have somebody like Chamber, that you could almost buy it, like four bullets or even three bullets almost every single eco round, mm -hmm. right? That could actually change the pace of like. 
I'm going to go for an aggressive push. I'm going to go for an off angle. On top of that, while I talk about this, let's bring up the next ability because I think this is also going to help out. The, the rendezvous ability that comes out of Chamber is when he could actually teleport, he could actually teleport instantly. There's, there's no Yuru delay in terms of like trying to get from one teleport into the other, as you can see right there. So he could actually have these, uh, these aggressive angles, get those one shots, and just TP away if he misses. Uh, which mm -hmm. is going to be uh, another great way for this type of agent to just escape. And when you could do a one shot across the map, I've always been the uh, the type of person that said, "Fuck, I hate doing 145 with a sheriff headshot across." You the hate map. headshots, though, Vansilly. How often does that happen? I've played ranked. Oh, you should see me. <laughs> uh... I think I think right now it's probably at the same percentage as a proto. And that's another thing. Like, imagine if a proto is lo uh, holding this gun. Can I? Can and, I say I don't think he's going to change the game that much. I, I don't think he's going to be meta in pro play because because let's talk like composition wise. Like a lot of teams are running like Sky Silva, Astro Viper, Jet. It, yeah. Let's say we want to bring Chamber in. Who do you replace in that comp to bring him in? I I think the most logical would be get get rid of the Jet maybe, but it's Jet. You can't get rid of her unless she gets like nerfed into the ground. I, I don't see it happening. Like, I don't think most comps can fit this guy on in because he has kind of an identity crisis in what the role is. You don't want to replace, like, your Raze or your Jet, uh, depending on the map, because both those agents are so good at what they do. And Sentinels have already fallen off in a big way, right? We don't see a lot of teams... I mean, they, they still get played, but it's not what they're used to, right? They're, they're not must-picks. And even so, if you want a Deadly Sentinel, if you're a team that plays around that, and if you're a team who has a player who, like, loves that lurking uh, and that kind of stuff, like, think about a Killjoy. There's so much more value in her utility. She also gets an alarm bot in a turret, similar to his two uh, little turret thingies. Um, she gets two really good mollies. Uh, her ult is, is fantastic. His ult, it's just an off that only one guy can use. Like, if, if, if you're an opper, maybe you take your jet player who's normally an opper off the jet. You're not going to want to do that. I, I don't know. I, I just don't see him fitting if, in unless we see fragger, major meta changes. I think there's room. Threat. I think there's really room in in the likes of like uh, some of these in game changers that we saw double sentinel comps come mm -hmm. out. I could see him potentially replace a second sentinel, not a primary mm -hmm. sentinel, and that's where like again. But how many teams are, are running like, second who, sentinel these days? There's a couple, it's but it's split. Weird. Like pretty much split. That's yeah. it. Uh, so like on one map, maybe some teams that kind of run that will run this, and I think it would be more beneficial. But at the same time. I completely agree. Like, I don't see a team that's going to be like, yo, we're playing him on every single map. Whereas, like, yeah. Astro, for example, complete game changer. Killjoy, you have to play her. Like, when these agents came out, or shortly after, completely changed the landscape of the game and had direct impact on 90% of pro games. But Chamber, I don't know. Probably a yeah. little bit more useful than KO. I think he'll be around a little bit more. But I don't think he's going to be meta at all. I think KO's a better agent than, at least from what we've seen, I think KO can okay. more value. Like KO stocks. Maybe like I'm on Van Silly's KOPium, but with the buffs, I think we're going to see even more KO. I liked what Cloud9 was doing with him, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, yeah. But uh, going back to Chamber, I think this is a, well, I don't think he's going to be a must pick. I don't think he's going to be as good as people are hyping up. Uh, I think it's a good direction for the game to be going in, having agents that aren't must picks, right? I don't want another Astra added to the game because she's fucking busted. I, I want agents like this that, like, you can go queue up your pug, and you can have fun shitting on some kids with your, your big sniper rifle that you get from your ult. Um, but in, in way of the, the comp scene, I, I think having an agent that maybe some teams will find, like having these specialist agents is good, especially as we get a deeper pool, maybe down the line we get agent bans and all that kind of stuff. It, it's good. I think just as a community, we're really used to agents being added and them instantly being really busted. So I don't know. I, I think he'll have a place, just, just not a big one. and. Not yeah, yet. it might be like Sky, where he gets he's not going to be as good as Sky, but uh, he gets like adopted later down the line, line where mm -hmm. teams start to realize that hey, maybe there's a place to use him. Yeah, I, I mean, Lothar actually brought up some some cool comps. If actually you're going to get rid of Astra, but who really wants to get rid of Astra right now? It all depends, but I think there's still a possibility that this type of like because you only have 12 rounds, right? You only have 12 rounds and a half. Piss around is super important, but if you have an agent going into the second round that you are going to have to go in an eco and that could be an agent that's going to change everything to bring that momentum, bring that economy back into your favor. I think some teams will favor that uh, because of, of the amount of rounds that are available for half. And here you go. Here are some notes from Lothar coming out as well. It's the one tap across the map. 
Uh, and of course, the teleportation is instant, as we mentioned before. But last but not least, this is, I'm going to have fun listening to all you guys cast. And then once he pulls out the ult and uh, hear how you guys are going to say Tour de Force. force. <laughs> <laughs> so, so an ultimate right now, Tour de Force, that's pretty much going to be just an all out sniper rifle that comes out. This is, of course, the one shot that goes out everywhere. No matter where you hit, it's going to be a one shot kill. But not only that, when it actually connects onto a shot, it actually creates that same type of radius that uh, his other ability, the trademark, does to slow the people in the area. That's actually pretty, uh, pretty strong as well. Although, um, my personal opinion is that if you look at these kills with this, this ult op uh, operator with the Tour de Force, that slow is only happening like on the other side of the map. So unless he plays super passively for like retake plays, which could be really strong, um, I don't see that 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 radius dropping in the round doing too much effect on the early round. You also get five what's bullets. The, what's the no scope accuracy mm -hmm. like on this gun? Do we know? Like, is it as bad as the, the off? Same. Honestly, I see a dot on the screen yeah. when he's pulling it so out, it's so it's probably the, the exact same. Yeah. That's depressing. I I was hoping for a world where it was going to be like super busted and you could just like play like Quake and just jump around corners <laughs> and no scope with the off. But um. Maybe yeah. we just we just nerfed the right click classic. What do you want to talk about? Jumping yeah. fucking full the fuck. No, 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 no. The right click classic was fun. Stinger meta was fun. When the game is dumb, the game is fun. <laughs> call so, this so what do we have right now, actually, for for the developer stats going on here with some specifics going on with the uh, with the chamber? Uh, I, I'm again. I think the meta looking at this right now is I still think that chamber could be very, very good. Um, I think he could potentially replace. Jet at some point, because again, these these Whoa. knives. How does the copium feel, fans? The copium feels great. How much Actually, you huff? I want it. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Everybody talks about me huffing about uh, the copium of C9 winning NASCQ, and I That's don't feel bad at all, right? right? So, I mean, uh, you sometimes sometimes like you 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 what miss 100% of the shots you don't take, so yeah, you, yeah. you got to take it from time to time. But yeah, we want to look here. There's there's a two way TP with cooldown, and only Chamber could use it because somebody in the chat was asking. Uh, how many times can Chamber use his teleportation? So I think that he could use it as many times as possible, right? Um, can can these be shot down? Do we know about this? I don't know. We'll no, have to I'm, wait. No idea. Uh, so note here from from our producer says that actually the teleporters could actually be killed. So if it's not if it's not shot down, I'm pretty sure that he could use it as many times with that cooldown. Uh, but unfortunately, we're one of the lucky or unlucky few that never gets a chance to try these agents when there's like play tests or whatnot. I don't know, man. Mitch, Mimi, we're kind of like, we kind of need to know these kinds of things as casters, right? So uh, it'll be nice if Riot could uh, invite us to some of these play tests. Hey. <laughs> okay, we're going to end it like that. Let's move on to the next one. We'll, we'll focus on the patch notes because we have the new act that's out today. And at the same time, we'll have the patch 3.09 that's coming out, which finally, chat rejoice. How many times have we seen in the past events looking at the Twitch chat where we have just a wall of text going, get it out of the game? Well, this time we finally have a little bit of changes going on to the classic right click and, of course, some changes to Fracture as well. Uh, so before we start over here with, uh, with the right click or the, with Fracture, let's talk about the right click. Uh, so we have a firing error, of course, on just walking, on firing error with the right clicks and also on jumping. So thoughts now, do you guys think that this actually fixes the right click classic? Um, I've heard some things around the Twitter sphere saying maybe it should just be two bullets on the burst. Maybe it should have more fall damage. Uh, maybe it should have more or even less damage on right clicks. Uh, and starting with you, Mitch, man, I want to know what you think. I, I, I'm thinking about all those things you've just thrown out. Less damage on right clicks. What's the point? Two bullets on right click. What's the point? It's like <laughs> it, either it has an identity or it doesn't. I think its identity is that it it fucking right clicks and it's strong. Um, not shouldn't be as strong as it is. Micro tweak it out. I don't. I can't imagine what a point five to point six second difference looks like. I don't think anybody can. <laughs> That's you know. I don't see the world that quickly. So, uh, sadly, my six hundred millisecond reaction time is gonna gonna be fine either way. I think the, the fuck did I get you to fucking immortal? With a yeah, no, it's not actually second reaction time. I don't know. It used to be like two hundred. I don't know what it's at now. Probably fucking <laughs> five. Um, but yeah, like, I look as long as you can't do this shit because it is ridiculous that like I'm a hundred percent confident if I'm running, jumping, and aiming at someone 
within mm. like five to ten meters and right clicking them twice they are dead that's kind of fucked up like that should not be the case so i i understand why it has to be changed but i don't mm -hmm. want to see it nerfed out of uh, out of play completely i think like hey if you're sat close in a corner you can right click someone they ain't got any head armor maybe it should just kill them i don't know i've always been a fan of no no shields on your head you die but then again we don't have we have light and heavy yeah, right? we don't have that. technically it's like a, an all over body shield i don't revert, know how i feel about it man revert the classic to what it was in act one where it was just fucking outrageous before anything happened but but for free okay. for free you just get the normal classic, right? It's like the Glock from CSGO. You pay to right click. You pay to right click. It's like 300 bucks oh. and you get the right click, but it's old right click. Oh. It's the fucking nasty, busted, ridiculous right That's click. That's pretty cool. But it's like $400. It's like the same price oh. as a ghost. Dude, here you go, right? It's $400. Here we go. 400 credits for it, but it's like a pin that you put in, right? So you, you even like this little animation, he puts a pin in. Thing is, you can either have it in or out. It's either you're right clicking the whole round or you're left clicking the whole round. <laughs> you do not get a choice. Oh Start, my you God. Have to, in the buy phase, you have to switch it. Chat, my co-hosts are going fucking insane. <laughs> no, I, I'm not even joking. I, I know it's a meme, but I'm not even joking. I think pay to upgrade the right click and, and have yeah, a ridiculous bro. gun. 400. If you're going to hold C long, if you're, if you're going on Haven, C long, no. and you're going to hold that, you can only right click, and then you jump around the corner, fucking jet updraft, right click me to shit. Fair enough, dude. You, you you know, you took the risk. You deserve that. I don't want someone to headshot me downrange yeah. and then start jumping no. the corner. You someone know? in chat says, WTF, just get a ghost. No one will pay for that. Have you seen what the classic can do? People will pay for that. $400? Actually, I think it should be like 401 So you can't get classic right click armor. Mm. And that's what I was about to say. Because even if it's like 300 or 400 when you have another ability, for example, that could cost 100 depending what agent that you play. It's still gonna be armor with a fucking right good classic from Act One. Yeah. Fuck that noise. Fuck what? that noise. Why do I have Twitch <laughs> pop ups here? What the fuck? Uh, I don't know, but I guess we should play <laughs> there that. There we go. Hey, thanks so much the for hawk. the follow. Hey, thanks for the follow. Uh, and the hawk. <laughs> How have you gotten but, but that yeah, on I, I think I think it's a decent change. Or I know you were only talking about like a point five or a point one or something like that, Mitch Man. But if you look at back at the patch notes it's still like an increase from what it was originally at, right? So if, if the firing error is 0.05 to 0.6, but it went from the total error from point uh, 1.95 to 2.5, so there's still a, a drastic change from what it used to be from the beginning as well, right? You can see here. And then the running, it went from 2.1 to 3.2 in the total error, and then the jumping is 3.0 to 4.0. So I remember back when TSM was still good, and you would have like this split right right bunny hopping right click classic of like cutler and haze and all that on, on on split that just owned everybody i don't think that's going to be happening anymore i'm i'm still thinking i'm going to see a lot of this bunny hopping and trying to land these right click classics but at least it won't do as, as much damage as as a, as it's currently doing although if you actually do check the notes it does say that they are still trying to give a lot of effectiveness into the really close range battles so if you're holding that really tight angle the off angle just around the corner there's still a good chance that you might be able to one click, right click classic your opponent. Get it out of the game is the meme, but I think the classic needs to have an identity. And that's what it's had for the long time. It's the meme gun, it's the right click gun, it's the haha funny classic right click, it's very good, get it out of the game. Uh, but if we actually get it out of the game, it, it's going to be depressing. I want them to keep that. That's why I'm still a shill for, for either make it purchasable or I, I don't hate what they've done here, right? Like, it's mm -hmm. it's it's fine. It's good at what it's supposed to be good at without being blatantly busted. So I think free gun should still be haha funny free gun and should punish <laughs> people who buy a vandal and light armor on second round if they don't check their corners. But I, I think it can be both. I think we can have our cake. I think we can eat it too. And mm. uh, all is good. So chat, we want to know your thoughts. Of course, tell us right now if you're here and listening and watching live here on twitch.tv forward slash dnpeak, but also tweet us out at Valoranting. We'd love to know your thoughts. If anything, we could bring them up into the conversation later on in the show or even in the further weeks. But now let's move on forward to the next patch notes. Uh, it's going to be changes on Fracture. So before we actually get into the changes of Fracture, I want to know your thoughts. It's been a couple of weeks since this map came out. We've played it quite a few times in rank. I know that I played with Mimi once two days ago and she rage quit right away and went to go duo queue instead of stacking with us. So uh, so Mimi, what are your thoughts on Fracture when it's not playing with people like me? I, I, I like the map. I think it's going to be fun. And I think the changes are good. Most of the stuff I don't care about too much. The main thing for me is 
Um, the changes to the sight lines in spawn, where is it? It's the bottom one there. New piece of cover and attacker spawn added to break the long sight line from hall entrance to B main. When you pushed halls, literally, I would do this. I insulock sky. I sky flash down halls. If I see someone, I go peek him like a like a maniac. If I don't, I just run down and I get a fast one. Fast lane on fracture is busted, and I think this helps uh, fix some of that pressure a little bit. It also makes that killjoy turret hold flank a little less powerful. Um, on top of that, I thought the other big issue with the map was arcade, and they fixed that as well. So it's like Icebox mm -hmm. uh, early on, where there were some small issues, but small changes can fix that. I think it's a good direction. I think the map's going to be really fun to see in Cold Play. I, I'm excited to see it at Champ. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel, can we bring that back up so we could actually read the, the full changes as well? Thank you. So uh, just to get back to it, too, we also changed... Um, if we're looking at this, uh, the B arcade, this is what Mimi mentioned before. So we sh shifted back the barrier because it was just a little bit too easy for the defenders to set up at the window side and just pop everybody off when they're moving in from the attacker side of arcade. Uh, so that this is going to make it a little bit harder. You're going to have to think about your setups a little bit more. We talk about the defender barrier at a rope moved up. Uh, of the ropes so now you could actually make it all the way up to rope side so if you're thinking about the a side that's that sliding door in that area so that you so you could set up a little bit more aggressively in that area and just on the other side we've also switched the ultimate orb and instead of being just around the corner that's going to be too easy uh for the attackers to take it's now been placed probably in more of neutral space i'm assuming right by the sliding door so you might uh you have to fight for this orb uh, compared to the other ones that are that are pretty easy, I'm gonna have to think. Mitch, what do you think? I think I think Dish is still pretty easy to take as a defenders. Yeah, I think so. I I, I think the majority of my fun has been had around uh, around a rope and pushing up into main. And I'm thinking mm. now that they've pushed the barrier forward about like getting those early round satchels in, even through the doors, breach stun down, flash or something like that. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun, a lot of fun playing that map. And the the thing that really gets me is that pretty much every lane as a defender that i've held has had its upsides and had its fun to it uh i haven't felt like i'm i mean it's just because i had the map as design right and that there's not strict lane ways but you never feel like you're out of the action you never feel safe and comfortable like uh you know as someone who plays maybe a side on haven as a cypher once you've got that calm down your one sight line you're just chilling the whole round. You're like, okay, cool. Yeah. I'll just watch this for someone coming up behind, and uh, that's all I need to do. <laughs> but now, all of a sudden, like, your teammates got your back, but actually your third back that you didn't think about, that hole over there that they can walk through and shift behind, it's like, oh, now you're fucking dead. So, it, like, it keeps you paranoid, keeps you on your toes. I, I really, really like the map. I think from a professional perspective, looking at how teams actually approach the defender side of this map is going to be absolutely insane. I cannot wait yeah. to see it. I, I'm actually excited for that one, too, because so far on just playing the agent from ranked, having a breach seems pretty fun to play, pretty easy yes. to play, too. If you're playing on the top of the ropes, you could actually nullify that 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 take for the attacker side orb and have somebody push from a long and fight. I think breach is really awesome for this map, um, and, and that's going to be a little bit uh, picked a little bit more. But uh, I think I think my biggest question mark, because it seems as though from even pro play, or the opinions of the pro teams, it's still very difficult to uh, understand how you want to really play this map because this is really an unorthodox map, right? We don't have that same type of like attackers on one side, defenders on one side, and then you have uh, a mid a mid to take control of. This time you're actually starting in the mid side for the defenders and the attackers to start on either side. And your rotation is actually through the mid for the, for the defenders. Although I think that after playing these maps quite a few times, uh, it seems to be a little bit easier for the attackers to maybe overtake the sites because you're actually thinning out these defense on either on either side because you can get pinched by, by both ends. So overall, for me, I I still think that it's a pretty decent balance uh, from somebody that plays as diamond. But I don't know mm. I don't know your thoughts of what it could look like towards uh, pro play here. I mean, uh, for me, I I think if you're a pro and you don't want to play fracture, cry about it, whine whatever i don't really care um this isn't counter-strike i don't think all the maps should be like counter-strike i like that we're seeing something new something creative i think for casual viewers it's going to be a really fun one to watch i think for for competitive people it's going to be a really fun one to think of think of new creative options you can't just default on this map you have to think of something cool you have to think of something new valorant is about innovation and and, mm -hmm. and doing what you can with this blank canvas and fracture is just letting those new ideas shine i love it and I, I think it's going to be really fun in pro play. 
I'm hoping that we're going to be able to see it for the Red Bull homegrown for this week when you're going to go cast at Mitch Ben because I have a feeling that for Ground. champions, there's a possibility that this just gets banned out and then it's going to be only next year until we see it. Just like how everybody yep. banned Icebox, just like how everybody banned Breeze. And then you look at mm -hmm. the past few events that just happened, there's been so much Breeze happening right now. So uh, I think it's going to take a couple of months, but we'll let that yeah. unfold. We'll let the homegrown see. We'll, let the, we'll see if champions, we're going to see that during champions or not. But it's time to move forward and talk about the EMEA Game Changers Series number two. And we're actually bringing a special guest, a good friend of mine. Happy to have her back here uh, on, or at least with me, but first time on the show, if I'm not mistaken. It is going to be Jess Goat. Jess, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Oh, you know, it's a bit of a pleasure to be here. And I've missed your face, Vans, and Mitch as well. You had me the other day, the unfortunate, you know, fortune of <laughs> hearing my Australian now. accent. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. And of course, one of my favorite women in the Valorant scene, I bow to you. So what's going on, guys? <laughs> <laughs> doing great, doing great. By the way, I, I mean, I haven't really missed you because I was watching over the weekend when we were catching mm -hmm. uh, uh, LCQ. So before I went on air, uh, I went all over to the channel and watched the matches. So great job to you, to both of you as well, Mitch Men and Jess Goat. I also like the costumes that you guys brought out for the show. <laughs> mm. uh, I, I was hoping to continue to see those contacts for today, Jess Goat, but it seems as though uh, it dries out your eyes quite quick. Yeah, I was struggling with that one. It took me about 20 minutes to pop those babies in. And then from then <laughs> on, I had to keep like putting some like solution in my eye. So yeah, I wasn't built for contacts, Beautiful. but that's okay. <laughs> Awesome. Well, let's get right into it and talk about the uh, the Game Changer Series number two. First off, we actually started the tournament with a Swiss format. And uh, let's go ahead, actually, Mitch Man, to explain a little bit what this Swiss format is. How is this played? How many teams do we have? And give me a brief overview. Oh, I can't tell you how many teams we had off the top of my head because I, well, we weren't covering that part of the tournament, but I know it was a record. <laughs> was it 64 at a guess? Uh, but it was it was a record anyways for the amount of female teams that we've had participating in an event in the MEA for Valorant. Obviously, it was set last yeah. time with the previous game changers. It was broken again with just more and more teams coming along. Ended up with, uh, I think, Giuliano and stuff were saying that, it, and obviously, they competed in the female scene of CSGO for a long, long time. And they said mm -hmm. that there were more teams participating in this than they would normally ever see in the CS scene, which is mm -hmm. insane if you think about it. For Series 2, it's literally the... The scene has only just begun, um, yeah. and yet already we're, we're pushing past the numbers that CS was able to field, which is a really, really great sign. That, that's the great part about it, too, because now, from what I heard, there was actually 58 teams in just a yep. second series, and that's mm. just EMEA. And to think mm -hmm. about, we have the North American scene, we have the Brazilian scene. Uh, there's just so much going on around the world right now for uh, for esports and, and the women's side. And I'm super happy to to see this. And even when you were scrolling down this this list right now, look at how many teams are actually signed by an organization too uh, yeah. in, within yeah. these 58 teams. That's actually fucking amazing to see, Mimi. Yeah, I, I really like it. I, I think the amount of teams being signed in, in NA at first, it was crazy. I mean, more teams are still getting picked up in NA. Same with the U, it's absolutely exploding. I mean, let's be real, female CS has been dead for a while. Um, it, its corpse mm. has been desecrated by Valorant. <laughs> um, but I, I'm glad to see all those players coming on over and, and being able to succeed, being able to strive in this game. My, my one fear is it with my one fear with all these rosters getting signed is like what's the longevity look like because right now mm -hmm. it's just a couple 50k tournaments a year i don't know how profitable it is for orgs obviously it's good pr right guys we have a women's team we love women yay and i mm -hmm. think there, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, orgs that are really really committed to, to their female yeah. teams and it's not just a pr thing but i am afraid that especially some of the lower level teams across multiple regions that are getting picked mm -hmm. up and no offense to those teams congrats on collecting the bag but i'm afraid that it's going to get to the case where where teams sign players and then six months we start seeing them get dropped on off i, I mm -hmm. hope that isn't the case i think there's a lot of longevity in the scene i think what riot has done to support it thus far has been amazing and i think that's only going to grow into this year i just hope that we can we can maintain here i i know i kind of Brought, up, brought a little negativity in, but but I, I, I think it's amazing <laughs> the, the amount of players getting signed because it's never been like this in, a, in any other esport for women. Yeah, and at least to shine a little bit of positivity into that negativity is when you're looking at the CSGO scene or even Counter-Strike 1.6, when we actually did have women's competition and women's tournaments, we're talking about like ESWC, uh, I mean, Copenhagen Games, I think, is another one. It's yeah. probably the two main ones that have uh, yeah. women events for Counter-Strike. So that happens like once a year. 
but yep. every single year there's always a good showing and a good amount of women's team and also signed teams uh, that still come in and, and compete in this tournament so um, I think it's a lot of props onto the organizations to make sure that they continue to support these, sure. the, these teams, which is great. So now that we actually have potentially more events with Valorant right now, then I believe that it's only going to get better. Um, but now to go back onto the negative side, and we're going to bring your your thoughts into this, Jessica. Or can I just go with Jess? Because I know there's a multiple Mate, Jess in you. please. <laughs> Oh my god, there's nothing worse than being called Jess Goat in the flesh, I'm gonna tell you that much. I'm just gonna nothing call you worse. Goat. You're just, you've <laughs> just become just I know, an animal I know at this point. when we're friends and we're hugging, it's like, I, I gotta hug you and I call you Jess, but you know, sometimes we're online, we gotta, we gotta bring that marketing out, we gotta let you uh, know it's man, it's, Look, it's Twitter. written below me, my man, everyone can see it, we leave it, we leave it right there. <laughs> awesome well your thoughts on this because i'm getting mm -hmm. into uh the point where we're getting into the bracket we're getting into the game changers women's series mm -hmm. number two and i feel that right now the the competition in itself is kind of getting shafted in terms of coverage and it feels like what the vct was at the beginning of the year last year where mm -hmm. there was zero coverage until you got into a certain point of the bracket so you guys yeah. had a weekend of coverage but it was only on like what three matches at this point yeah, I think the best thing that they can do, and I think that that is probably the direction they will end up taking, I'm sort of speculating here and, you know, doing an educated theory craft here, is that what they're essentially doing is that they're guesstimating what the views are looking like, how everything's flowing mm -hmm. for them, etc. And then as more of the series come along, they'll extend that into future days so that it will cover more days. And mm -hmm. so I think probably the best business practice would be to do it that way. I'm sure they have huge brains behind this, of course, and way more educated than I am. But if that was me from a business <laughs> perspective, I would be like, okay, let's do like one stream for the first one, a couple of streams for the second one, a number's looking good, a sponsor's looking good. Hell yeah, we've got numbers and we've got money for it pop it in then to like you know all of the playoffs plus whatever else before that and then just keep extending it from there assuming that the money's still pumping and the numbers yeah. are too so yeah i think that would be the big talking point for them on that one and it's for what sure. it was like in na as well right like we started mm -hmm. off game changer series one open calls wasn't yeah. covered at all it was just the yeah. w limb bracket uh number two the dignitas one we did get open calls but it wasn't like riot sanctioned it was well it was riot mm -hmm. sanctioned but it was just nsg ran it right it was nsg mm -hmm. assets it was nsg production uh full on and then series three was the first time we actually got barracks for the qualifiers we're on the official yeah. valorant channel all this i think it's just gonna grow for that for for other regions as well na was the testing ground for this now we're seeing expand it's popping off in sea it's popping off in eu and i i'd imagine by like late next year uh, all the mm -hmm. regions will be or all the regions that have game changers will be in line in the in the amount that's broadcasted or at least that's my hope all right well now we get actually into the bracket itself mitch man so we talked about x amount of teams we talked about 58 teams going into a double donation bracket i think we went into like 16 teams uh through the round robins to be able to make it into this uh we see some very notable names i think g2 is probably the biggest one on the board for me where they actually went uh lossless right they got six they went through six and oh and around robin and i was like oh crap here's a good old uh x set slash lay cells or whatever when uh, it was zaz and company back in the counter-strike go days uh and they could just dominate this bracket but as you could see they got uh they got knocked off by oxygen gaming quite uh quite early in the semifinals of the upper bracket yeah yeah well i i mean it it was quite light considering where they'd been. Obviously, we had had like a week of play at this point. Uh, they'd gone undefeated mm -hmm. throughout the groups or the er earlier stages, the mm -hmm. Swiss stage. Then moving into this, uh, they looked incredibly good against everybody except for like the teams that you would expect them to struggle against. Like when you come up against 10 star or as you just said, oxygen, those teams are definitely going to challenge you and push you the full distance. But ultimately, the only team that this G2 roster who previously our critique was heavily centered around the fact that they we knew them or at least the majority of them from their cs days not not just mm -hmm. on their own but together and then add mimi into the equation who was one of the few players who had a conversation around actually breaking through to the mainstream scene in cs she had mm -hmm. a lot of hype around her this is a roster that we expect on paper to be fantastic and when it came to their certain mechanical decisions let's say valorant specific ones they didn't deliver the first time around but they really start, like came into this tournament and they were clean. I really thought they were going to be able to take it. Yeah. Well, it looks like we have the uh, Mitch's delivery that just answered. So I'm going to let you get that, uh, Mitch man. And <laughs> Jess, I'm going to ask you. That's just an upset <laughs> dog. He's just upset. He wants, he wants cuddles. 
Uh, so 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 we get into this matchup. We get into the the G two goes in and oxygen as we just mentioned before. Mitch mm -hmm. talked about how good they look. What are your thoughts actually on seeing how oxygen currently played uh, in this tournament? I think probably one of the scariest and most unknown quantities inside women's EMEA scene in Valorant is the Turkish players. And it's not mm -hmm. that the fact that we hype up Turkish jets and all that kind of stuff, both in the women's and mixed side of things. But I think just overall, the decision making is swifter than a lot of the other teams that we see. And as a result of it, they look like they're more aggressive, but it's not really aggression that we're seeing. It's because they act on decisions and adaptations quicker than other women's teams I've seen do. And so as a result, I think they fall underneath this kind of expected stereotype of Turkish players, but I think they're just a super well-rounded team that works on adaptations rather than set strategies time after time. And this is why teams aren't able to sort of adapt to them or preempt them when they come up with counter strats, et cetera, because mm -hmm. I think Oxygen is working on being that team that uses their phenomenal mechanical skill without a doubt uh, in line with a little bit more utility usage on the fly rather than predetermined. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was trying to look at, too, when we just looked at the highlights of that second map, and I'm looking at the composition that we currently are running for Oxygen Esports is, you know, we're not really running an Astra for this team. We have an Omen that comes out. We have a double Sentinel on top of that. When we talk about mm -hmm. the, the amount of utility, I think, like, the Sage, the sage uh, Slow Orbs with the Silver play could actually bring in a lot. Uh, even when we're looking at Oxygen Esports on this map being Breeze, it looks like it's going to be a lot more standard too, right? So understanding the meta, understanding how this double initiator could actually bring a lot into uh, information for a team with the uh, with the toxic screen from Reinsa, uh, it looks like they put up a pretty good fight against G2. I'm not going to lie. I think that when it came to the finals as well, like I know we're sort of skipping ahead here, but mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. you're speaking about G2, you know, doing better than they did before. They they absolutely improved themselves 20-fold between Series 1 and Series 2. That's without a mm -hmm. doubt. But I think what Oxygen did was they just rounded out their edges. They just sort of tried to perfect the little things that you can't m sort of see on the screen when we're watching a game. You'd have mm -hmm. to go through and you'd have to minutely analyze these games, even just an overhead, to work out exactly what they've perfected between series one and now i still think they're the same team in the core i think what they're doing now is they're just being way cleaner with what they how they do things and i think that comes down to adaptation there's a lot of teams that try and counter strat this team is going well let us bring compositions that allow us to adapt on the fly and see mm. what the team does to us and you can't counter strat that and i love teams that do that and again the phenomenal uh, gun skill we see from the turkish scene here and the women's scene i mean that just counters with it so well yeah uh, and with that, Oxygen Gaming gets that win versus G2 goes and goes into the grand final. So we're moving now to the lower bracket where Tenstar, a, a team that, you know, when we're looking at the VCT uh, qualifiers with the men's side, Tenstar, I think even you, Mitch Ben, was like, oh, man, these are one of the this is like one of the types of rosters that nobody really hears about that could potentially yeah. upset a lot of these teams in the VCT. Tenstar, they won the Game Changers series number one, but battling back here in the lower finals. Uh, tell me about this matchup in this series against G2, because Tenstar on the women's side is a different story than the Tenstar from the VCTs. Now, we were expecting a lot uh, from this because last time around, Tenstar were by far the most impressive team. Like we said it coming into series two, uh, even when we saw them drop to the lower bracket early on, we were still uh, very much believing that they had the potential to make that comeback purely because they they were so damn good last time and they reached the same level of play here. I think a lot of teams are starting to catch up, which is why we saw so many of these games go closer. We don't need to talk about map number two. I have no explanations for what happened there. Uh can move swiftly on and say they know how to bounce back well, at least. It was... Uh, yeah, it was it was it was strange at times, I'll say that. But I think all in all, like Ten Star as a team for me were uh they had a close loss versus G two. They bounce back, they look incredible second time, two zero it nice and clean. And I think that the thing that really amazed me the most about this roster is that we came in and we talked a lot about Cloud because Cloud was statistically one of the most yeah. impressive players, mm -hmm. but also just so fun to watch, so so explosive. And even though she did incredibly well here. You got to see so much more depth out of the team, whether it was Nino closing out game changers with, with the ace that they had, uh, whether it was Lorelia just fragging out like crazy every single game on an Astra. Like, she was incredible to watch the flank play she was able to pull out. Nalo doing much the same. It was really, really fun to watch Tanstar, and I think they're like, they are my favorite team in the female scene. Honestly, I'd love to see them in some VCT quals as well. I, I, next year when that time comes, I think they'll give a lot of mainstream teams a run for the money. 
Yeah, I, I want I want you guys to pull back for a second. I know this is getting us off track, but I like making Vanzilli's <laughs> job more difficult. But um, I, I don't know how much of, of NA My or the Brazilian women scenes that, that you guys watch, but um, stacking up EU, I, I want you to think, how how good are these top EU teams compared to like a Cloud9 White or like a, a Gamelanders no. Purple or a team like that? Do you think they're they're anywhere near that same level yet? No, I mean, Yinsu asked us on the desk. Uh, I think I can't mm. remember if it was grand finals day or when she asked it. She goes, you know, what about C9 White? Like if we paired them up, you know, if we had an international land, what do you think, Jess? And she was being all nice about it. Ryan was being all nice about it. And I just came out and straight said it. I said, C9 White, no, they don't have a chance. And the reason I say that is because I just think that a team like C9 White is, has gone through this whole, like, you know, rounding out the edges and stuff like that for the level that they play out at the moment. And they've already polished the edges and all of these other teams, Oxygen G2, especially, um, even 10 star, even though they move in packs, they make a lot of fundamental mistakes in their mm. rounds, especially late round. And so I just think C9 White, they would just, they would just find that tiny little hole and they'd rip 10 star apart in a best of five. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least, at least one thing that's good about 10 star though, is, uh, their ability to fight back. Right. So they, they mm. came back from the lower brackets. They went into the lower finals to beat G2 in a 2-0 fashion, and then even going into the grand finals against OXG, if I'm not mistaken, against Arsenal Gaming, they actually had the full uh, bracket reset. So they went for the reverse yeah. sweep after mm -hmm. losing 0-2. So tell me a little bit about this, Mitch, starting off with this series. Was it was it due to maps that they're weaker on that Oxygen Gaming were able to take advantage of? Or what exactly, how did this pan out here in the series? I don't think so. So obviously we started out on bind and we ended up with an incredibly close game and going into it, we had a lot of conversation around uh, how we thought bind was going to go. It seemed like realistically for oxygen, you know, that they don't play it a ton that, and they hadn't played it against any top tier teams. It looked on paper like this was going to be 10 stars opportunity to bring it across the line. And obviously that is exactly how we kick things off with it with a little upset 13 to 10 close game second map we knew as well 10 star would have potential and another close game and they just kept on racking up and i think <laughs> when you looked at oxygen they really surprised us by just coming out of left field really when, when, when it comes to bind we thought that that was somewhere 10 star would catch them off guard we looked at it as yeah. oh within this veto 10 star really got the leg up here haven't they and they ended up what coming out of the first half with four rounds or five rounds and, and then barely um you know ended up on their double digits but it was it was incredibly tight and i have to say it was the same on icebox it was more acceptable there but when they'd already lost bind we thought it was over like as soon as icebox went oxygen's way as well come on no one no one actually resets a bracket like that <laughs> and and the the further down we go down towards this series though jess is See, we see a 13-10, a 13-11, and then a very close third map, but then suddenly you kind of see 10 star just dropping off into the later rounds in the in the last two maps where they actually had a hard time to get that double digit on that board. I mean, we were talking about this when we got there on the desk, and we were like, you know, this is Oxygen's first ever best of five. Like, how mm. are they going to fare, like, jumping into a best of five stamina-wise? And I mean, for most of us, like, I used to play competitive FPS, and yeah. for the most part, you train yourself with the stamina, you know, whether or not you're just scrimming, like, a six-mapper or something like that, and you put yourself through the ropes, like, you know, 100 times over to work out the stamina. I think that Oxygen both with being a little bit of tilt going on, of course, you know, they're very emotional players. They're very um, aggressive players when they need to be. And I think they tried to make hero plays as they started to lose. And those hero plays stacked up, one person blames the other, and then emotions kick in, the stamina starts to weigh on you. There's a lot that goes on. I think it's a bit of a learning curve for these girls. As I said, first best of five, you work out what the mistakes are. And I think 10 star, they showed they were the more experienced ones on the day. Mm. And even going back to the bracket in itself, because, you know, we, we have favorites in G2, we have favorites in 10 star was mm. oxygen gaming for both of you, like a surprise going into this bracket should, should have, should have there, uh, should, should there have been, there you go. I found it another team, <laughs> uh, when you're looking at these brackets that you think would have made it, uh, should have made it into the grand finals or at least deeper in a run. I'm thinking, for example, just by pure brand, like Supermassive blaze, uh, mm. guild, your thoughts mm -hmm. on this here, starting off with you, Jess. I mean, Supermassive Blade got knocked out by the reigning champions. I mean, they took a mm. map in that best of three, and uh, things weren't looking like that horrible for them. I mean, they were like 
I mean, the first map was good for them. Yeah, okay, there wasn't necessarily close maps in the other two, but I still think they put up a heck of a good fight. So yeah, super massive, massive plays for me. I mean, this just shows how strong the Turkish region is. I mean, I think over 30% of the player base in, you know, VCT, uh, cha uh, not champions, game changers, yeah. is like Turkish. So it's like... You know, you expect them to be a strong region as a result. I don't know I'm kind of like I feel bad for Chap End. You know what I mean? Like I want to mm. see more out of Chap End, like way more. Um, and I, I can't remember what they did in series one. I think they got knocked out by Oxygen. Like speaking of, so I'd like to see them do more. <laughs> yeah, the thing for me as well is like Rix and Guild were the two that, uh, uh, outside of SMB, obviously that I think really surprised me by not going through. But again, with the losses that they took. Guild going down to 10 star, rakes down to Guild in a close series. It still paints the, those teams as being in the kind of skill tier that we think they are, that they could push to a finals. It's definitely possible, but this time around, you know, you meet 10 star in the lower bracket. Unfortunately, you're getting knocked down a few pegs. That's uh, that's how things go. <laughs> Do you guys think that, that it's a disappointment for a team like G2 to get knocked out so early? Because I, I think compared to, well, not so early, right? They, they made it into the top, but to not make yeah. that finals, to not be able to win things on out. Um, because they've played together as, as this as this core, I think, longer than any other team in the event, right? Like, they people saw them come over from CS, thought this was going to be yeah. the dominant team in Williams Valorant, thought they were just going to shit on everyone. Do you think it's a, it's a disappointment what this roster is showing right now, or, or are they looking good? Uh, I mean, the best the best example I can give you from inexperience on the team, Anya being, you know, one of them. And if you watched her interview, she spoke about how she's extraordinarily cocky and still has a ton of shit to learn. Um, so I can absolutely see that there's a, a, an imbalance on the team. And you could see it throughout that series as well. Petra was the only one, and of course she wasn't in like a duelist position or anything like that, who was putting up numbers for the team, especially when things started to get tough for them. And I put that mm. down to experience. She kept her cool, calm, collected. She was very environmentally aware. Like she had, her game sense was clearly still ticking, even though the team was struggling. And then the likes of like Anya, even like, like we, we call Mimi experience as well, but even Mimi was making mistakes of like trying to make hero plays as well. So I think there's just a little bit of this... Um, no, I, I don't want to call it like lack of leadership. Maybe there's too many cooks in the kitchen on that team. I don't know. Mm. I have no idea. Uh, but they need more leadership because you can't have people like Anya running around thinking they're going to get like 2K, 3K every round the way that they were. Nah, you got to pull that shit back. That was, that was bad for me <laughs> because Petra was the one trying to carry the game and uh, that must have been frustrating for her. Yeah. yeah. I think Pete. the other side of it is that like they have, I think like three tournaments under their belt with G2 mm -hmm. now. They've been grinding a little bit there. Obviously, go back to their previous t team name as well. Being competing for quite a while, like I want to, I want to sit back and say time fixes a lot of that. But I agree with you in a way, Jess. Yeah, it feels like time will fix issues within the game and understanding yeah. of of like m mechanics. But when it comes to making ludicrous plays, giving away advantages, that's not the kind of thing that you go, oh yeah, raise nade needs to be thrown like this, and suddenly you remember to play with your teammates. <laughs> Definitely something that uh, that can be looked into. Yeah, and, and I just want to ask quick, because this is something that I've been like the, the person whining about it in NA for ages, which is women's teams not playing in open events. I just, yeah, I've been constant, I'm so sorry. I've been constantly <laughs> bitching on Twitter about that. Like, can you guys just fucking play events? Like, there, I, I don't want to, I don't want to say any team's names, but there's some teams in NA that have not played in any open events. What's that like in you? Like, how many of these teams are actively grinding away? Because we have a huge amount of women's team playing this. How many are playing Oof. the VCT? How many are playing the, to be like the, I don't want to say the real events. Are there like any the, open the events, real open EU, events. Yeah, that is true. Does EU exist? Question mark. Yeah, well, that was going to be my question yeah. because all that we were talking about when we Mitch, like even on the desk, we were like saying, well, like next year when they get a chance. Like, that was yeah. the statement we made. What like, is there? Every VCT. Is there any tier two tournaments in a EU? Them, no, well, a lot of the teams uh, did participate in the open calls, but again, we didn't have a female scene at the time, really, yeah. other than yeah. people who were just dedicated. So they just got shit on for the most mm -hmm. part. And uh, I think now that as we come towards like having a, a level of sustainability here, we're going to push past that. We're going to get to the point that these teams can actually practice. It's the same reason that Brazil is trash. You know, if you don't have fucking 10 good teams to prac against, and you yeah. instead have like three good teams. And then as the coaches said, some of the other teams just don't turn up to scrims. Well, then what the fuck are you doing? How are you going to get better? Yeah. You can't. It's not It's not possible. Um, and I think now we're in a much better position uh, to hopefully push past that. But it's, it's also been so long uh, since we've had open calls, right? Like I think yeah. coming into next year, uh, we, we will see a lot of female teams make it deep into VCT open calls or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
is there instead. <laughs> well, we'll wait and see when that's going to happen there. At least we saw the final moments of that match between Tenstar uh, and Oxygen Gaming, where Tenstar actually won that last map 13 to 6. So we talked about the resiliency. We talked about the comeback play. And Tenstar won this beautifully to get the second Game Changers uh, VCT under their belt. That's Series 2, hoping to make it a three-peat with Series 3 and B, the Cloud9 White of Europe, of EMEA. Mm -hmm. But with that, we actually do have a sot from Yinsu and one of the winners, it's also going to be with Lirilia to talk about the series and how they actually came back into the game. So let's check it out. Hi, Lirilia. Welcome to the show. Uh, and I cannot believe how exciting it is to introduce you as the two-time Game Changers winners. And Yay. what does this crown mean to you? Because you've been here before. You've won one already. And what's great about winning it twice? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a way for us to confirm that... Uh, we are strong and uh, we know how to face uh, other teams in, uh, in Europe. And uh, yeah, we're pretty happy about this win because it was important for us to, to, to have this second uh, crown. Yeah, it, it looked quite tough, especially from the beginning where you were 2-0 down. Uh, talk me yeah. through what you guys did to get back into this game because to win the next three maps felt like a really difficult task. Yeah, well, um, we're. I think, yeah, we're like that. We we like to 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 make us uh, stress, I guess, because um, <laughs> we did that uh, during uh, all the tournaments. We, we we I think we're better when we are we are face we are facing uh, like when just just when when we have no other choice than winning. Like, we are mm -hmm. better and. Uh, that's where we shine and uh, we have a strong, really strong mental, I guess. So, yeah. And there you go. So hopefully now that uh, next year or whenever Series 3 is going to happen, we're going to see that three-peat happening. But final thoughts going into this one here, Jess. Uh, we, we asked the question before that if it's NA versus EMEA, mm. probably C9 Blue just knocks it out, of, or sorry, C9 White knocks it out of the park. Mm. Where do you see currently like a 10-star or G2 goes in uh, or Oxygen Gaming in the, the rest of the rankings here? Are they better than the other regions? Um, yes. Uh, especially 10-star. I mean, the way 10-star mm. moves as a team, like when I'm watching even just like VCT normally, like regardless of the region, I'm watching VCT normally and I'm sitting there and the way that their team plays, their coordination and synergy is the mm -hmm. same way that when I watch 10-star on some of their rounds move around the map. So if they're moving around the map as a fundamentally good and well-rounded team, I, I'm going to just throw it out there that at least 10 star as they currently exist would be better than most other regions. Do they stack up to C9 wide? Okay, well, C9 wide has had a heck of a lot more time <laughs> to sort of yeah. throw this shit together. So yeah. probably not. So like if you on paper, no. Um, but I still think that there's like Turkish teams and stuff like that, like Oxygen, who come in and have like a really good day. Like they're popping the Red Bulls or whatever they're popping. And like <laughs> their gun skill is phenomenal. And they're coming out of like, like it's not a lie. How many like, you know, retakes that they pull out of their ass. Let's be realistic here. They pulled mm. out of nowhere. They had no util. They had no business getting retakes that they did. So I think that there's a good opportunity for them to come out and people just don't know what to do with them. So probably Oxygen and Tenstar would be the two teams at the moment that I'm really vying for. Mitch, when when are you going to rub it in my face that EMEA is going to be better than NA in, uh, in a game changer scene? <sighs> Whenever the first land rolls around, I suppose. You know, oh. I'm not I'm not one to sit here and talk about <laughs> if ands, but I'll just talk about facts and first land event, whenever it may be, EMEA is taking it easy, man. And he's gonna lose honestly, to Brazil. I won't <laughs> <laughs> Alright, listen, let's watch your fucking mouth. Okay, let's the, some game fucking game line is better than God, any God. of the EU teams and they get <laughs> shit on by Cloud Nine, so you could have come into oh, my good. house and shat on my dinner table and it would have been more polite than what you just said. Sheesh. Oh, I would have taken it in a kinder manner. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, Man, at least... you guys go crazy here. My God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I speak from experience. Jess, Sorry. It, Anywho, if Vance. you want to come back for more of these, Jess, feel free. You're, I mean, you're more than welcome. This is how we do the show. Yeah. No, this is a lot more This is a lot more casual than... Uh, oh, actually, I was going to say more than, uh, you know, having to work out how tall Mitch actually is so that All every right. time we make a joke <laughs> on the desk, like, it's not dry as fuck. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm so sick of these short jokes, Mitch, because it, as Me long as they're dodgy... Too, me, Jess. Me fucking too. Wait, how <laughs> tall are you, Jess? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you yeah, my bad. My bad. <laughs> my bad. I'll just shut up now. I'll just shut up now. I'm going to let you guys... Actually... 
Don't shut up, Jess, mm. greatest of all time, because I want to know what's next on the plate for you as we're closing up the uh, the Game Changer series number two. Uh, look, what I can say is that uh, I've been yelled at by Yinsu quite a lot for not being there for series one. So for okay. series three coming up, uh, I may or may not be able to, you know, put my schedule in check for it um, so that I'm appearing again. Uh, for other Valorant stuff, um, unfortunately, I've had to deny pretty much the rest of the year outside of game changes just because mm. the schedule conflicts with my other games heavily, mm -hmm. um, which is extremely you say, sad. You're from, you're uh, from Rainbow. I'm from Rainbow, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm doing a couple of other stuff, uh, signing with a couple other things. Nice. I'm signing a lot of contracts coming up, and there's a lot of Jess exciting things Jess is fucking busy, going. chat. So long We're just story blessed short, to have her. I'm, I'm busy. Um, I'm a busy tonight because I'm going to go drink wine with the missus soon um oh, yeah i yeah, know that's that's work no i'm kidding <laughs> i love you stop damn if my body goes missing you know what's up um all right, no, all right, all right. no no but I, I love valorant uh my hope is into 2022 i get to like be around you guys a bit more but i can't you know really like confirm or deny because contracts are mm -hmm. a hectic at the moment so fingers <laughs> crossed if you guys can like kidnap me and do all that shit like let me know we'll try uh, i'm down we'll try i think yeah. i think us personally, as the other three, we're still trying to secure our contracts. So yeah. We'll oh shit! My bad. We'll, we'll, try, we'll try to hook it up at the same time when we have these discussions. But... Yeah, we'll go in as a pack, a wolf pack. We'll just say, exactly. you know what, we, we come as a quad, and we come as a quad, or not at all. Yo, Mitch is just going on the, you know, what do they say on the edge of the seat or whatever they say. I don't even I, know the sayings. I could definitely see Mitch Man as our Zach Galifianakis of the Wolf Pack, and he's just gonna drug us, and we're gonna end up in Vegas with Uber. <laughs> whoa, and yo, whoa, whoa, yo, are you, you guys okay, free for New Year's? Because like I, I see some shit going down. Like, I'll fly to anyone. NA. <laughs> all right, I've all never right. Well, drugged anyone. I won't we're do that. We're digressing. We're don't digressing. We're just talking about uh, we're just talking about a lot of uh, orange juice. That we're just gonna get high in vitamin C. Yo, so, uh, up. Jess, thank you so much for hanging thank out with you. us. Uh, make sure you guys give her a follow. I think it's down over here. There you go. Uh, Jess Goat yeah. at Twitter. And then uh, hopefully we'll get you on uh, sometime soon. Enjoy the one with the misses, and uh, we'll you. catch you on a later show, hopefully. Uh, and with that chat, we're going to go for a break. And when we come back, it's time to break down the NALCQ. And, of course, have my smile from ear to ear about Clyde 9 Blue. So don't go anywhere. We'll be back here with more Valoranting. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Valoranting as we just closed off the Game Changer series number two with our beloved Jess. Now it's time to talk about NALCQ and soon going into the NALCQ as we talk about it. We'll also bring Zeta from Cloud9 Blue over onto the show to talk with him as we're just waiting for him to get ready. So now's a great time to tell your friends and your family. Tune in to Valoranting, twitch.tv forward slash DNP. If you're missing out, retweet it at Valoranting on Twitter. And then if you miss it overall, you can check it out on YouTube later. YouTube.com forward slash Valorant. Plug all of that in. Let's talk about LCQ. So we're looking at the bracket right now. It took us a while here, Mimi, to finally start off day number fucking two of the NA LCQ. Because, you know, we went through trials and tribulations uh, on the first week. Uh, in, let's say the first day in LA. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was just me, but it felt like it was definitely a little longer between day one and day two. I don't know if it was, I just had like a crazy night or something, but it definitely felt a little extended. I'm sure nothing went wrong, but uh, nope. yeah, I mean, once things got rolling uh, for, for the online tournament, things were super exciting. It, it's a shame. It's a shame that we didn't get to see the team on lands. I mean, the energy for that one day we got was fantastic. Mac just screaming mm -hmm. his shit on land, <laughs> just hearing the teams yell, getting to meet everyone in person was great, but uh, yeah. It yeah. is what it is. Shit happens. It's not a, it's, it's just kind of is what it is. But uh, the online tournament, I still feel like it, it really impressed. And we got some, we got some, some quality Valorant. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we'll bring out some more contradictory things or, uh, or uh, let's just put it out there. I mean, even if we're on LAN in LA two, three weeks ago, uh, unfortunately, the matches are still played on online servers. So yeah. it wasn't really necessarily a LAN at that point. And that, that opened a can of worms when the Hunter Thieves started tweeting that out. So, Playing on, but playing on LAN with a high ping, they looked really good. And then playing online with the same ping, unfortunately, didn't make it. So let's actually bring up that bracket once again here, uh, Daniel, if we can, please. And we'll look through and we'll briefly discuss about this run uh, for the NALCQ. Because if you're looking at the grand finals or you're looking at the upper bracket finals, what the hell is this team being rise coming out of nowhere? And we'll definitely get into the conversation of talking about this team once we get there. But to start things off, uh, I think we started day two with uh, a very good matchup, at least, right? We had the um, the C9 versus uh, version one. 
uh, as we continue down towards over there. And uh, version one for me, I mean, this was a great matchup overall where the storyline was actually pretty cool, Mimi, because Vanity leaving version one, version one, once again, another tournament where they can't get a, a solid five that they stuck around with for at least yeah. a month. Uh, and then you have a KO coming out of Zeppa, and you see how C9 Blue kind of took that in a one-way fashion. Yeah, I feel like the story really wrote itself for this one, right? Where Vanity leaves, hops on over to another team, gets those new opportunities, and then damn, does the new team look good. Chaos 9, the three boys that have been playing together for ages in Zeppa, uh, Leaf, and of course Vanity is at IGL. Uh, on this match specifically, and on the Breeze match that we're looking at right now, it was just like the, the first kind of game where we got a reminder of how good Leaf is. This was the game where mm -hmm. he was just running down mid, jumping up on that little wall elbow like every single round we also got introduced to the to the zeppa ko i know you were very <laughs> pleased about that because you got your prediction right and you got your k-opium to finally pay oh off my but God. honestly it, it looked good Love i think it. this is the best i've seen an na team utilize ko because for 100 thieves they had the moments with it but it looked so much better in c9's hands the pop flashes were great the synergy between zeppa and leaf was still there and mm -hmm. zeppa is just a fantastic player on its own right and it enabled him to play as an individual on top of it v1 just didn't look like they had a counter whatsoever. A lot of it was forced errors, but also a lot of it was, I think, inexperience as a squad. Odorous <laughs> had kind of a, a tough way to, to get things started, to, to be quite honest. It, it was slow for him. I still have some faith that, that V1 can be better than they showed, but uh, C9 just looked like the better team through and through. And with that, I mean, we talked about just the C9 versus version one, and we talked about the coming out of KO pretty much from, uh, from Zeppa into the matches, but... I feel that we actually have somebody that could actually talk about that even more in details because it was going to be in 20 minutes where he was going to come on, but he wants to come on down. So he, he's excited. I'm excited. Let's bring him on. We actually do have Zeta from Cloud9 Blue to actually join us to talk about this. So Zeta, first off, welcome to the show. Congratulations on winning NALCQ. We talked about it uh, over the weekend, but we want, to, uh, we want to underline that one more time. So congratulations, man. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh... Congratulations. <laughs> so, uh, Zeta, before we actually get into the details uh, of, uh -huh. the, uh, of the matches, I actually want to ask this question for you so we could, we could actually, uh, you know, solidify how we pronounce your name. Because some people are saying that apparently it's pronounced like Jetta. I, I DM'd you and I asked you how we pronounce it. You told me it's difficult as fuck. So just <laughs> tell me how you pronounce it right now and we'll all practice one by one right here. Uh, I say like every every way like i think that I how do you it, say right? it though sonny yeah, how, how, how do, do you, say, you it? say it uh we say in korea like uh jetta jetta jetta, jetta. yeah That's but, perfect but i think it's between like a british and just like american accent so i don't care someone asian right here asian jetta <laughs> yeah. it's gonna be easy i just think about the volkswagen car so we're we're all set we all know now casters around the world it's now jetta uh from from cloud nine blues so let, let's get into it so first off uh we just talked about uh jetta about the uh your matchup versus version one and we were really impressed about zeppa pulling out the ko uh into the tournament mm -hmm. uh, i wanted to know your thoughts actually as to why bring out a, a KO when we actually had a lot of like um, rays or whatnot, or maybe another initiator uh, such as Sky that could be used in these lineups uh, for for Cloud Nine into this tournament? Uh, we've been talking about the KO and Breeze a lot because since like meta is like changing, and then like people a lot a lot of people used to play a Sky on that map. Mm -hmm. We also thought like. Because of the Viper War meta, like on A, for example, KO Flash is really good against uh, some kind of like that, those walls setups. Hmm. Because that's meta. Like, like Phoenix like, can flash, uh, fl flash through the wall on yeah. like, everything. So the concept is uh, similar to uh, KO. At the same time, because it's initial meta, I think uh, KO is like, really good against the sky. The counter sky, like also like a Viper, like KO has like EMP knife something, mm. so it like has every every like um materials like to play breeze like well. Mm -hmm. Also, like Eric is really good at the KO because when whenever when 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 he swaps to like a uh, Baron from CS, the yeah. KO has uh, every almost like elementals of the CS uh things. Mm -hmm. So that agent is really fits to uh, Eric's style. So yeah, I think like 
also like meta and like his play style just work, works really well i, I think <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 and I wanted to ask, ahead, once, ahead, once you guys finished up this match, you, you started playing on into the next day, and we saw the KO come in and out. Initially, when you guys were playing V1, you were, you were playing it on pretty much every map. Then you right. started to pull away from it. Was this something that was pre-planned, where you were like, all right, we're going to show some of the KO early, then we're going to switch our comps later into the tournament? Or was it more like kind of taking stock after every day and being like, what's working, what isn't working, and, and just sticking with the good stuff? Uh, I think it's... a. Uh can be a kind of random because um if we just like feels feels out about the comp we just like pick it like like mm -hmm. we did on split against rice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's like up to eric like basically if eric wants to play ko we play ko or if he doesn't awesome. want to pick the ko we just like it don't pick it depends on the opponents but it can be uh, eric's like uh, opinions too yeah he, he, he... I like that uh, actually Vanity allows everybody to have like that that type of freedom going into the game. But I, I just wanted to ask you this question also. We just watched the the replays of your your first match against Rise going into that upper bracket. And unfor unfortunately, um, I think it was Poise, right? That lost internet. No, it was Superman that lost internet onto Breeze. And we had to replay the overtime onto the next day. What was going on through like the camp of Cloud9? Like was it... <laughs> Was it annoying? Was it depressing? Because you guys were on a, a, a high in this, in the, into this matchup because it was going back and forth. Uh, <laughs> uh, initially, we kind of like, I was like, oh shit, we want to play. Why are we <laughs> why are not, we are not make us like, play faster? But I mean, yeah. at the end, I just like feel like it gave us also like a mental reset, so mm -hmm. which is really good. So, I mean, it doesn't really like uh, matters for us like I mean, initially it was like pretty annoying, but I mean, as time goes by, like it was pretty, uh, uh, not really bad. I mean, it's not worse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And and to talk about uh, just your play style in general too, uh, because Rivington and I, when we were casting a lot of your matches, we were, I was praising on the amount of fucking shock dark damage you were able to do uh, on as your tech as Silva. So tell me a bit about the like. Your train of thought is like, when's the right moment to pull out these shock guards? What do you use it mostly for? Because sometimes you're using it on eco rounds to prevent people from coming in. Most of the times it's on these double shock guard kills that you get on like on like uh, people planting and whatnot. Uh, how does how does that go with you in terms of how you play the Silva player? Uh, for shock dart, I just guessing it's like a defense on situation most of the time. So mm -hmm. for example, if there are ecos like. Yeah, people like to tends to like rush, right? Or like take yeah. orb. At least like they want to take in or like trying to contest that. Mm -hmm. So as a Sova player point of view, like you can actually like have a situation they probably take the orb or like they probably rush some side. So at that situation you just like calculate the situation and you try to like use a shock dar. So yeah. Like on awesome. or or like gun rounds, like people like to People have to plan or like kill everyone to win the uh, attack side, right? So mm -hmm. if they want to like take this like spike plan, and then you you have like a moment you can shock guard the planner, or or if you'd like miss your timing to kill the planner or like damage the planner, they have to play a post plan situation, which like which is like pretty uh, situation is like uh static. So mm -hmm. you if you know about like where they can be, like, you can use a shock dart to damage them, so it mm -hmm. makes, like, your retake easier. So that's how I'm thinking, like, when I'm using Silva shock dart. Nice, nice. Yeah. And I wanted to, to kind of pull back to, like, your, your team dynamic overall, because obviously you've been on the roster for, like, what, since January, so coming up on a year now, and you've been under a couple different IGLs with Cloud9 because it's been constantly rotating. Mm -hmm. What do you think makes Vanity and, and this specific roster different? Why why are we suddenly finding success now with him coming in? Is it is it his calling? Is it uh, the synergy between those three players? Is it, is it something different? What What's the biggest change for you guys as a team? Mm, I think between, uh, I mean, two biggest part. Before Vanity and after Vanity is, I think it's like micromanage in the mid round situation, because sometimes like we can feel uh like kind of nervous or like antsy or just like don't know what to do mm. as a as a unit. Uh, he really likes to uh, do a micromanage, so it leads uh, like a team into like really advantage situation, even though we got the, these other matches a little bit. So as from point of like a 
from like a point of view as soba i think it's really good because we actually can take the more time to like recharging our like utility or like recharging our things to how to say set resettle sure. so we have a actually like a can be we can have a we can have a some like exact power or like a post plan situation like calculation things like we have a lot of like options to play with so even though like we meet like different opponents like to play with but we can like figure out like how how we counter them or like how we approach them mm -hmm. so that's the biggest part i think like about the micromanagement yeah and, mm. and talking about how you counter how you approach different uh, different opponents i know vanity is an ideal love a lot of what he does is is that micro that mid round that that in-game stuff that he's so good at is just kind of being a cerebral igl but you also have autumn on the team who you have been with since you were on cloud nine korea mm -hmm. what is kind of the interface like between autumn and and between vanity because obviously both of them have have tons of ideas have have tons of have tons of input what is that like in way of how you guys are thinking of these new ideas, how you guys are implementing new comp changes, what's that interface like? Uh, I think between Autumn and Vanity, uh, like in game wise, Autumn not really uh, touching the a lot like deeply. So because he respect like this uh, between people, I mean players and the like IGO things, mm -hmm. and the actual like strategy coach, which is uh, James. Autumn is like autumn thinking process is kind of like from the bigger picture, like outside the game or like meta changing or like how to, I don't know how to explain like deeply because of my <laughs> English issues. But, sure, but your English is just perfect. Autumn is like really respect the players to play like with their own style, and then he just like trying to like find the maximum like efficiency with between like players and the like idea and the coaches mm. how to work really well. Like, how like he makes our like makes us like an oil machine <laughs> i can say <laughs> <laughs> yes and so 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 that after that like we can have our like synergies even much like better mm -hmm. yeah that's that, how we works it's awesome yeah i i even see it from like uh just following back then like the the korean scene for like even starcraft when you have like these more holistic type of like coaches like autumn it's like really going on not only like the psychological factor but helping you guys out and like getting that training schedule correct and like having a good structure in terms of a good me mentality to approach uh your your job as professionally as possible and then you probably have somebody like james that's going to be able to help you out in terms of like the the strategic point with uh, with vanity and to, in terms of like tendencies and and um countering your opponents or whatnot um, but I, I want to get back into the bracket as well, into this matchup against Rise in the first time that you guys played against each other, uh, Jetta, uh, because we get to the third map where on Haven, we usually see a lot of good performances from, from the team with Cloud9. Uh, but you lost this matchup against Rise like 13 to 5. And my, my observation looking at this matchup was like this Derek on, a, on, a, uh, on an Odin that kept spraying a lot and doing a lot of damage to like, um, to even Leaf that was trying to get a lot of aggression in the beginning. Was this something that that caught you guys off by surprise going into this matchup? Um, yeah, obviously, it's in the certain round, uh, when Derek, uh, Odin spammed through the window, like, we got spammed kill. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually knew about that he gonna spam that, but, I mean, we just, like, was, mm -hmm. like, kind of lazy, and then we got cut off guarded. And and then also, like, we made a lot of, like, individual mistakes. Like, I mean, it's not about the mistake, it's, like, play style we could have played kind of like um like unique things like exec or like a pop or something like that but i mean we just trying to like uh, too much of the uh, 1v1 like lurking like trying which can be a uh, good sometime but i mean we obviously like, uh, like didn't work like how to say well enough for that thing so we just like mm -hmm. we went really like a sloppy run going on and then like we just like lost our momentum i can say on the haven mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we just like lost i see uh and, and at the same time uh or even talking to vanity before uh in in la when you guys write lcq and then um talking to rise during the interviews uh throughout the week it seems as though like nobody on your side of the bracket either being cloud nine or being rise or anybody else wanted to practice against each other or even it was hard for you guys to find even practice now because in this off season for the other teams that haven't had a chance to make it to the LCQ, they kind of like just stopped practicing anyway. So how difficult was it for you to prepare for this event as a team? 
Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. We couldn't find uh, any of like great games to play in the stream. So yeah, that's definitely like really hard to practice uh, uh, properly. Uh, so I, I think it's we are kind of, we have a really like a great like things now. I think because, uh, as like, we went like uh, uh we went through the upper lower like upper, our uh, lower bracket. Yeah, we could play like a lot of like teams like hundred dips and the exit and then rise and then rise for like twice time. Yeah. So, I just like feel like we just like play the great stream even though it's like a great uh, important tournament. Like I just feel like we just like play the really great streams. So yeah. as like yeah. we play the matches like we just improve ourselves like the real mistakes from the real little mistake to the like comp thing like mental thing like comp processing and individual performances and the confidence thing so i think we got a lot of like things from the this tournament even though awesome. we couldn't find the great like a scrim teams agree agree you guys call yourself the scrim team now scrim 9 and it it paid <laughs> off during the lcq <laughs> the uh so moving on to the lower final right you guys took on 100 thieves and it started out in pretty tight fashion but y'all really got the reins towards the end i mean breeze was just a blowout what did you guys make of 100 Oof. thieves in, in their current state you think boy put in that roster is really uh what they were missing um i don't really think so i think uh in my opinion i think they just like they were trying to like play a uh, um same way when we mm -hmm. played before, but they uh I think they're obviously they like lost their uh, IGL. Their IGL was mm -hmm. like left the team, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that thing is like kind of big for them. Also, um I think they just like played the uh, how do I say underperformed like compared to Scream, in my opinion. Mm. And then we got the momentum, obviously, too, because our, like, call was really uh, clean. And then, yeah, I think for them, I like, think they may be thinking, like, unlucky or I don't know. But, I mean, they just, like, uh, underperformed, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I agree with that, too, because I think once once I looked at uh, 100 Thieves as a whole, not saying that, you know, they... I'm not saying that Boy was the solution or was not the solution. I still think that with time, they could do pretty good. But having having like boy plug into like the controller role, where even on for example like uh, Icebox and Breeze, he was playing um, Viper. I didn't see much going on from like a Viper tech like Nats kind of did and like change the way that Viper is usually being played when he just dominated everybody in uh, in Berlin uh, and and got that 3-0 against NV in the end. Right, his his tech was amazing. Uh, but when we're looking at the Vipers currently playing in North America, still after this, after that event, we're still throwing like the the, the regular walls. There's no Viper lurks. There's no using that. Um, I know that it's supposed to have been uh, fixed, but I think it's still prominent in terms of like the 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 toxic sweep, as we call uh, the smoke sweep. Um, so I haven't seen that. So I think because of that, you become still uh, potentially very readable in your plays. And I, I find that uh, you guys over at C9 here, Jetta, took advantage of that quite well. Um, so we get into we get into potentially now the the grand finals. Um, I was expecting because of all of these matches that kept going into like overtime in all the games that you played here uh, with Cloud Nine, man, that second map on Split, you guys got a fucking thirteen zero against Rise. And when Rise first came out, we were like, Rise is actually pretty good on Split. Why? Because Superman was amazing as an Astra, and the retake play from uh rise was actually really really fast and explosive and they were good on trades how did you guys pull a 13-0 uh, against rise on that map uh i think in addition to your saying about the viper things like in that yes. i think it's all about the creativity mm -hmm. so why i think like a superman did really great because i think he has his own like creativity and he actually like showed us like his gimmicks on the breeze like first yes. match yeah. So I think a lot of like controller players requires that those kind of like cre creativities. So so on like a split, uh, it's I didn't really see a like, rise like Viper usage on the this like split 
about like creativities i mean mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. on breeze it actually like makes us really a uh, higher situation yeah because we got like on him on by him like uh, on <laughs> a- entrance you if you remember like yeah it was like a four or a five kill a four kill right in ot yeah the four yeah. k's so yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, Jetta. Just to explain for the for the chat too of what that tech was. So he was putting this viper wall in the beginning of a main, and then puts a poison cloud right next to the poison, uh, right next to his wall. So he could pop that up and dance around like your owl drone when you're trying to clear that area. And he swings out perfectly left and right to be able to uh, not only get that four k in overtime, but he did it multiple times throughout the throughout that map. Actually, the first time you guys played. Yes, yeah, so obviously those kind of gimmicks is like actually the same concept of a like a net like bind hook a window wall a window mm-hmm. like poison or so it's kind of risky but it's like a high risk high reward right yeah so those kind of like creativity is like really needed that's why I think like a hundred dips is pretty like uh viper usage was the same and then also like at the end the rice match was like we just like fell there doing the same thing also we even though they play gimmicks like we already know. So that's why we played really uh, easy it, at the end. Mm-hmm. Yes. So we just like thought they're going to play like the same as we, like we played on the screen or whatever. So that's why I think Nathan just like told me, Sonny, you want to play a, a bridge? I have an eight comp oh, instead. Yeah. yeah. Because he already knew like I can play a bridge on that map because we already 13 won like a Sentinels before. So yeah. I had a really like confidence with the bridge play. Yeah. Also, their play started like kind of static, so not really dynamic on that map because they fo- follow their own plans, which is like a paragraph for us because we already knew. Yeah. So we just like thought maybe Nathan thought like with the, our normal comp like it can be a fifty fifty, but I mean with the eight comp because we we can actually like a hundred percent counter them. So we just like uh, proceeded and then like we just like owns them. That's why I it showed. Yes. Yeah. It showed the fault yeah. line. They weren't ready for that shit. Yeah. <laughs> it, the, the bridge looked awesome. I wanted to ask once you guys get to the grand finals, you're, you're playing against Rise and you did something that I think a lot of the teams that, that Rise was able to bowl over didn't do. And, and you like completely shut down Shanks. This guy's normally the man who's like every round sprinting down mid, getting that initial frag dashing away. I mean, similar to how Leaf plays on your team. What was it that you guys were able to completely deny that in a way, just kind of stop Rise in their tracks? Like on Breeze. Uh, what'd you say? Sorry. Like, like on breeze, yeah. Like yeah, on like breeze. on on that breeze map number, the first one you played in the grand finals. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because of the Nathan's like uh, personalities and the how to approach it, his own game because he's like never uh, scared of a uh, to like any opponents. Like he just like do his shit and then he just like make it and then he just like get away. <laughs> <laughs> so all I need to do is like support him from the behind as a silver. And game is too easy when Nathan can make <laughs> those play. <laughs> yeah, he 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 was pretty ridiculous um, uh, on that game as well. And what what made you guys pull pull the KO back out this one? Was this what like just like he was feeling it? Like Zep was like, "All right, guys, KO sounds fun in this one." Or was this something you were planning ahead? Because I know you were saying you had games where you did, you had games where you didn't. Because I I feel like Breeze was definitely the the map where it seemed like that KO found the best effect. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. We had a reason because, uh, in the like first match, uh, we didn't use a knife for um, EMP's uh, Superman's uh, gimmicks, so mm-hmm. we just cut, got caught off guarded like by his gimmicks a lot. Mm-hmm. But after we lost that match, like we thought like we can use save our knife to uh, actually like side hit, so we can EMP the Superman's like, uh, gimmick mm-hmm. things, so mm-hmm. we can counter him. So that's why, like, we play the KO again. Also, like, we just resettled our setups a little bit too. So, yeah, it works. It paid off. And then, yeah, it did. Yeah, that's how we won. I guess. Yeah, that's why I was like, because when we were casting that grand finals, Riven, I was like, man, they're not doing what I was gonna predict that they're gonna fucking do. Because Zeppa, when he was playing the KO on on the other maps too, on Breeze, sorry, versus the other teams, you guys would always knife like the A holes at that door just to make sure, at least on defense, if somebody's gonna move on towards that area. If not, you're always gonna be knifing towards elbow for information there. But then in the end, it just looked like you guys were using that knife a lot more on the site takes, and it paid off quite well. So. Um, yeah, I think that was that was pretty good in hindsight uh, as to why like it shows now uh, the evolution of like a, uh, like why it's important to watch demos chat because you get to see the differences mm. as to how teams adapt to a specific team and want to try to take over. So well done on that. 
that means you guys actually get into champions and you're now moving into Berlin for champions. So congratulations for that. And I actually wanted to ask you, like, what's next for you guys? Are you going to be boot camping in Europe to get ready? Are you on break this week? Uh, have you guys partied yesterday? What's what's going on here right now in the Cloud9 camp? Uh, yeah, we definitely, <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> definitely had a party like a Brazilian <laughs> steakhouse. We went to Brazilian steakhouse, which was really good. Nice. Yeah, and then yeah, I just like hope uh, people play more of the KO like Eric. <laughs> <laughs> after after people saw the KO usage, like I think to people, more people like you're gonna use KO, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, and then we cannot teach them about the, like a nascent jet play. So uh, figure True. out, guys. Yeah. True. <laughs> yeah. I I wanted to ask you one thing, uh, but before we let you go, um, because this has now been what almost a year that you've been in the U.S. Before, obviously, you were playing competitively at home back in Korea. Now you get to go to an international event. You get to play up against um some of the other Korean teams that'll be going there. How do how do you think that region stacks up heading into heading into champs? Oh yeah, so. Yeah, if you go Berlin, like we can meet the Pigeon Strikers, right? So mm -hmm. which can be, which is really uh, special for me. And then I can personally, I can reunite with the C9 Care members too. Yeah. So which is really uh, fantastic. Awesome. But uh, obviously, um, we are still looking forward to play uh, with the different Legion players. Uh, mm -hmm. so we can play a Gambit. Like there was like obviously a super team from like EU region, mm -hmm. and then. Also, obviously, we can. The biggest thing is like the international matches. We can see a lot like different comps, so we can learn and then we can like discover a lot like options how we play certain agents. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it makes us really a strong team if we like play against them. Yeah, that's why. Awesome. I think, yeah, I'm looking forward to play. <laughs> and, and and with that then uh what we'll do is we're gonna let you go so you could actually relax and uh jetta thank you so much for the time to hang out with us too and to come on the show and to talk about the run here for cloud nine and giving us the insights actually behind like some of the strategies you implemented going into the tournament um do you have any final words you'd like to to give to the fans to everybody that's currently watching and the future watchers and listeners oh yeah uh thanks for the like who watching like our tournament and thanks for the cheering us and then we will just like keep trying to like approve ourselves and then just like keep uh watch our like match for sure for sure yeah. jetta and even for me i'm gonna have to say keep fighting and also a, a good <laughs> for uh, coming on to the show so uh Anyan, and uh hopefully uh well we'll see you in berlin hopefully we can see you in berlin as casters but uh, we wish you all the best, of course, and uh, do us proud here for North America once you get to the champion stage. Okay. Thanks, See you. Awesome. Sonny. Thanks, man. So, so chat, we'll go back here. Big thank you. Big shout out to uh, to Jetta from Cloud9 Blue. Make sure you also uh, follow him on Twitter. I think it's uh, we saw it at the bottom, but it's official Jetta that you could go over there and um, and check it out uh, at the same time and give him some support and some love. Uh, meanwhile, though, Mitch Man just stepped up he had enough he's like he heard I, too I don't much about chance. a better region and he was just he was afraid yeah, he was yeah, quaking in exactly his boots. this guy actually wants to throw bets against me i am like he's, if he's already gonna walk away from that screw that shit you know so um we could go back here and look quickly at the bracket mimi uh i just wanted to go and and have this conversation so let's pull that bracket back up and we instead of going from match to match at this point now we understand a little bit how c9 moved forward i wanted to gather our thoughts onto some teams that actually didn't perform as well, oh, which yeah. is, uh, well, no, I wouldn't necessarily say as well, but did not meet to expectations of what the major crowd would expect, right? So I think the first one we could talk about is probably the, the elephant in a room being 100 Thieves. So we talked about, even for me, saying that it's uh, not necessarily because Boy uh, was like the winning th solution or not. I think anybody else taking a spot wouldn't have helped 100 Thieves in this situation. Uh, but I wanted to know, what do you think is missing from 100 Thieves to be able to be that powerhouse that we all want them to be? That is a, that's a tough question to ask because first of all, I, I don't, obviously none of us know why they dropped steel, right? Like we don't know yeah, if it yeah. was, if it was something more personal, if it was something about that. But I think that, that barring anything like personal as just a strategic level, it's pretty fucking troll to, to drop your IGL like a few weeks before a main event. Like, I, I don't know. 
Nitro sees a good idea, right? Like he he has yeah. the the pedigree in, in CS:GO, and I think his calling actually looked pretty good in this event, right? Like his mid rounding mm -hmm. was good. That's what he excelled at. He was already working some of the mid round stuff, four hundred thieves. So I, I don't think that was the issue whatsoever. Um, but I think it's just in bringing in a fifth player, they just need time to develop. I'm not saying that Boy isn't the answer because well, Boy had some really underwhelming games. There was a couple moments he shit the bed. Later on into the tournament, as we got deeper, it felt like he was really starting to pick up. And with time, I, I think it's possible that, that 100 Thieves um, can get to the, the level they once were, uh, even mm -hmm. if they do keep with Boy. But for me, I, I don't know. I, I think they just got a little overhyped go going into the event. Like... I. I, I'm going to say it. I, I think they were a little overhyped going into the event because a huge roster change like that, having to completely reformat how you call, how you play your game, that's going to fuck a team up. And yes, they're amazing players. I, I was having a whole conversation with Mark, with, with Bach about this, that he's like, oh, they have four amazing players, whatever, it'll be fine. Even if boy sucks ass, it'll, it'll be all good. The rest of the players <laughs> are enough to carry. But I think the competition good, is too close for that right, for right now. I think the competition in, in NA is too nearby for... Um, uh, for for, oh. for teams to just drop their IGL and think they're still going to perform, I don't know. This this round was so fucking sick, by the way. So I Anime even Blade then like battle. Yeah, the Beyblade battle and even even the call in itself. Like this is this is not a hundred these. This is this almost feels like uh what was it? It was New Turn versus Version One on Split, where it was like in overtime, like one of the most crucial rounds into a matchup, and then you call out a full rotation split. Uh, from one side to the other, and Rise just did that onto 100 Thieves, and it was yeah. just beautiful to watch because you actually have a five versus five fucking retake into this game, and all the utilities have been burnt, and then you just have like the most excellent trades that came out for Rise uh, in the end. I'll, I'll definitely touch base on Rise after, but I still want to go with like the shortcomings, the the cons, uh, and, and like the disappointments for some of these teams that didn't meet up to par. And I think the next one that I'd like to bring up is is gonna have to be Phase at this oh, point. Yeah. Uh, I think hmm. phase phase we all think that you know personally I don't think that phase would have qualified to champions. Uh, personally, phase probably uh, would be in a top four for me, but they actually fell short even more from that. And now I want to know what happened because if you're looking at how phase played, you have Corey that switched phase out played? from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. They were they were a little bit non-existent in that in that tournament, unfortunately. And they've tried different things, right? First off, I think that question of like JDM coming as a coach, that's still that still is yet to be answered. Uh, but the composition in itself, the play style for this team within the map. So you're looking at face pulling out Corey with a sky instead of doing the secondary duelist, but it still wasn't enough to rise. So What's missing here? Like, Baby J started calling more for the team, so they're trying to add more structure into that, into the IGLing. Uh, but it still feels like it's not enough. What's missing now? Still feels like this team is over relying on Baby Bay. Map one versus Rise. Baby Bay popped off. They win. Yeah. Map two, Baby Bay does not pop off. They lose. They lose uh, pretty badly as well. Like, what, 13 8 on Ascent? Uh, a map that shouldn't be too terrible for them. Yeah, it's a good one for Rise, but after that, it, it just snowballed and, and their bind didn't look that great either. It, it, it still feels like the team is just too reliant on this one guy and, and the contingency plans aren't there in, in the way I was hoping, right? I, in the, coming into this event, I was thinking, like, all right, come on, Corey. We want old Corey back. We want <laughs> it back. Uh, maybe he'll be able to pop off didn't really happen to, to be quite honest it didn't really step up in the way i was looking for Rockies had a pretty good tournament but i don't know it, it still doesn't mean a lot it still feels like they're over relying on baby bay it, 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 I, for me phase is a team that had one good tournament run ender said this on the desk they had one good tournament right that masters one they looked won. great yep. what have they done since then nothing this. nothing this this losing you always like want to give us some faith this. right you always yeah i mean i wanted wanna... to give him faith right because uh, especially since we were initially thinking this would be a land tournament, you know, land buff, it is what it is. These are very experienced players. They're very good players, right? Baby Bay's super talented. On paper, these are all great players. It's just something isn't clicking, and when Baby Bay's not hitting, no one else is is finding the, themselves into his place. And uh, on top of that, it's it's a situation where it's still, like, I don't know if coaching is going to fix it. I think bringing in a new coach was a good idea, but mm. what is JDM added? What has he added? I, I, I'm not sure because on paper, right, he's a smart guy. I think he'll be a stronger voice than Trippy was, but he's never coached Valorant before. He's never played competitive Valorant before. Like, yes. I don't think he's ever IGL'd in Counter-Strike either. No, so. he didn't. So that's why I'm like, 
I didn't know how I felt about this JDM acquisition. I was like, yes, he has experience, but I think they need like a strong leader who can help with the strategical side. Because to be honest, in a lot of ways, the strategic side of phase is lacking. If you're a more strategically sound team, you will not need to just rely on one hero. But it was still, when the aggression doesn't work, phase starts to stifle. Uh, when when Baby Bay doesn't get something on the attack side for their default, things start to stifle. Mm -hmm. it, I don't know. Like I no nothing against anyone on phase. It's just this team feels stagnant stagnant to me. Mm -hmm. And they have since Masters won. I mean, this is this is where I pull out the uh the 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 hot take then silly nice guy is because I'm always that type of person that's like, fuck man, I wish if there was a, like a comeback arc for any of these teams that they keep their five player roster, right? I I said the same thing for TSM. I'm hoping the same thing for phase. Uh, I'm hoping the same thing for other teams right now too. Like even even Envy before they had the choices, uh, the the swaps out from Caboose and from Mummy uh, to get the results that they have right now. I just kind of wish that I saw uh, like the the potential that they had as a team before to come back with that same core before we have to go into these drastic changes. But maybe now it's due for that stuff, right? Maybe it's due for those changes. I don't I don't wish that upon Faze, yeah. but uh, but I think it might be the time. And yeah. I, I and it comes back to another one where I I hope that. You know, uh, during the off season and going into the new year, is another team here being exit, right? Exit for the majority, as I called it, 2020. But you call me out that it's 2021 here, Mimi. But for the majority of the year, um, exit is that team that's consistently number four right now, uh, being that NV of 2021. So, Mitch Ben, what what do you think here for for exit? Is it like do we do they again need more time for development, or do we need to find some new free agents to come into this roster i don't know i look at that team and i think there's a like maybe maybe you can make a change with someone like death but even still his numbers haven't been uh, dog shit you know and he is providing a lot a player like death on this lineup i would say he's probably probably oh, agree. coming in as a backbone so yep. outside of that the players who are kind of being tested here your bcj your pure like they're delivering zek and had an okay series or set of series as well when you take in the c9 blue game as well as the v1 uh like overall i think x is a team that can flourish with time maybe uh you know a little bit more resources thrown towards them but the reality is they've got plenty of time now i don't think that this is something uh, a roster that warrants massive changes but the thing is and as it is always going to be probably more of a concern in eu still because y'all have all always had your third party tournaments but there isn't that much to play for especially big things teams start to get a little bit itchy and even if mm -hmm. it is just those 2k tournaments if you're not consistently winning them or challenging for the top week to week there can be changes like that i'm quite worried like once we go to off season i think there's going to be a lot of roster swaps and i yeah think that the majority of us are going to disagree with most of the decisions but it's just the way the off season goes we're probably gonna lose some good teams i That's, don't think that... xset's going to get any changes I'm going to be honest. I, I think not. there'd be fools if if they change exit right mm -hmm. now. Because mm -hmm. I ragged on FaZe because FaZe underwhelmed me a lot. I think that team needs to get boomed a little bit. Things have to change because mm -hmm. they've had their chances. It's clear that this is not working and it's probably not going to work with these specific five players. Exit, however, think of old exit. Kind of dog shit. Like eight, eighth place pretty much every single time, right? Like they, they were not doing well whatsoever. They bring in Def, they bring in Zekin, and things start looking good. Tournament results keep improving. It is such a young roster mm -hmm. in way of Valorant. You have Zekin, who's a kid who can be molded into anything. Even though he fucking betrayed me in, in Crab Game last night, I still have faith <laughs> that this guy is going to be one of like the, the top the top tier players uh, uh, within the next couple years in, in this Mimi. game. Yeah. I saw I saw a tweet that came out this morning before our show though, and I think the betrayal came from you, where you just slapped him off the lava. I killed Zach rock. because Zach won like three games in a row. <laughs> okay, but back to my point on Exet. Back to my point on Exet. Um, Exet, Exet is at a place where they are improving every event. Yeah. I really like their yeah. coach Psycho. I think he has a lot of great Same. ideas and is adding to it. I, I really like Deficit and IGL, and I hate to to craft myself as like the big Exet fanboy, but I thought they were going to win this event. To be quite honest, it's, going into this, it's a good and synergy. I, the synergy looks amazing. They're showing creativity. They're showing mm -hmm. new comps. They're constantly innovating, constantly changing. It looks good. They're not still. They're not stagnant. Give them six months, and I think that they can. They can. I, they already are a top team. I think they're already yeah. a top five mm -hmm. team, if not a top four team in the region. I think they I th will be a, a, a. They will maintain that spot. I don't think they're going to be number one, but they're going to be up there. 
I definitely do think that uh, that Psycho and, and and Death together bring something really nice to the oh, team yeah. for Exit because, you know, when when we actually heard what it was like the calling system before they actually had like a specific IGL uh, in Death right when we did it was still in the roster it was just, um, it was Psycho just basically calling like three rounds ahead during the timeouts and whatnot because of course a coach can't talk between uh, the rounds so uh, it it. it it added more structure in terms of going round per round and mid round calling with depth. And then you could also now have that system where you have somebody like psycho yeah. that could have a more or like a holistic overview of the play style of exit and do those micro corrections by watching these VODs and whatnot, uh, that could help death into the further calling. So I think that structure in terms of leadership works out very, very well, both a very, very mature coach and player in uh and psycho and death specifically uh because they're adults they, they they take this as a real job as well a professional job that puts yeah. food on the table uh so i think i think they have uh tremendously good leadership in those two um and to go back in the other point too like with, with teams that have to blow up i mean if you, even if you look at the tweets coming out from Baze uh after after that event it's like hey man thank you so much for the year uh, don't know what's gonna happen. They know they're or, gonna get so much for the support. I know this is it's so fucking sad to read, but I don't I don't yeah. want to I don't want to I don't want to get too too deep. And I know I I sound kind of heartless sometimes when I'm talking about teams because I'm just like talking Mimi about like, I want to see perform. Mimi Mimi an asshole confirmed. What the heck? <laughs> I, I feel for the players because someone put this in the Twitch chat, but I'm totally with it. I think like a lot of these pl the players on face they go to another team mm -hmm. they could be like top 50 top 20 top 50 players in NA. they're really yeah. good on an individual level i think just this team just doesn't have a strong enough leadership role right now they don't have someone who's going to whip them into shape I, I i had faith that maybe jdm was going to be that but i don't know i i don't believe on it i i think the roster does kind of need to get boomed and uh and remade and i think these players have a lot of potential going forward so i hope the best for all of them i hope that phase can find success with whatever their new re reiteration is but um mm -hmm. talking a little bit more uh, about what i was saying um with uh with with exit and and, and with death i think it, it, it was crazy that it took this long for for def to get picked up with a good team because to be honest a lot of teams lack a really strong igl and i think death has potential to be up there with some of the best i've gotten to i got to listen in on a couple of their stream their scrims with comms and stuff and it almost reminded me of what players uh, like like uh like what sunny was saying with with playing under vanity mm -hmm. and that he's really good at macroing while still giving space, right? Like, mm -hmm. Purar has these rounds where he can be the room. Like, if you look at Exet early, it's oftentimes Zekin and, and Purar, they just get, like, complete freedom to just roam the map, play as a duo, set themselves up for whatever they need to get done. And then once information is gained, that's when it just gets locked down. Def makes a call, they send it together. It's it's just like the fundamentals that really every team has, but it's working for them. And seeing that structure working so early in the lifespan is good because it takes a lot of teams a while to build into that. And having mm -hmm. not just one, but two strong leadership voices that can work together to mold the team, especially when they have young players, just makes me feel like this team has a lot of potential. I think for, for me, uh, Rise and Exet are going to like be like my two biggest teams going into next year mm -hmm. that I think can like, stay in that top four i i do agree that no matter what i think the off season is going to be fucking insane with the oh, yeah. with the roster changes and the roster moves and we've already seen some some players going in from like korea to uh north america for example of course jetta and and uh even spider with t1 which i hope i wonder what what's going to happen with t1 next year too once uh once they have their official five coming out so there's nothing but excitement but i'm also potentially questioning will there be some changes between eu coming to na and na going to eu as well because we haven't seen that yet we've gone through a whole year we have some teams that have also uh imploded such as guild for example and and we'll see what's going to happen with that i think that's going to be a topic we could talk about next week at least uh so let's focus back into the lcq and and close that loop for the lcq so we have c9 that won in a dominant fashion against rise three to zero a 13 zero on that second map and of course we have our good old vanity uh, that it was going to be the main uh, interviewee in all of these matches and a person that shows a lot of confidence and a lot of smack talk like Mimi on Twitter uh, has uh, has been uh, interviewed with Smix here uh, for the grand finals after their victory. So let's have a look here at the first side. Yeah, no, I definitely think the biggest thing with it was like... Uh... I mean, we've been completely like destroying people in scrims, like it's all over Twitter, like everyone knows it. Uh, pretty much like I said on, I've said on interviews, like as long as we play like 60% as good as we are in scrims, we were definitely going to win the event. 
Um, maybe not definitely, but we have pretty, pretty, pretty good chance to win the event, I guess. Uh, we have pretty good matchups against a lot of these teams. Like, I definitely think Rise was the hardest team in the bracket, without a doubt. Like, I don't, I'm, I don't even think it was really that close, to be honest. Um, obviously, we struggled a little more against uh, the other teams, and like Gen G, but that was like one of our first matches. And I think the longer we played together, like in a like official environment, I think the nerves started to go down a little bit. Which you could see because we stopped losing like these like stupid like four v twos like all of that. So it was pretty impressive, I think. <laughs> so so your thoughts on this right now, guys? Because at at the end of the day, I I don't think it's necessarily on mistakes from from C nine for uh, for like losing these four v twos or or five v two situations, but it was a lot on like just how good Superman and Derek are or were for for rise in that tournament as the clutch players right we didn't have a chance to talk about rise that much so Mimi, give me your thoughts uh, about rise going into this tournament because they definitely deserve some credit and to be talked about i was sleeping on rise so hard i'm gonna be honest yeah. i i wasn't just sleeping i was like knocked on conscious like just like <laughs> completely like in a coma for months when, when i was thinking about rise and then they i thought they were gonna get shit on but to be honest i i thought they'd lose to phase and they come into this mm. tournament they proved me so so wrong and i love to be wrong in, in those ways i love it i love it i love it because they, they looked amazing y you talked about superman for me normally we talk about shanks superman was like my mvp of this yes. team for this tournament he looked so good the clutch the sneaky viper plays we talked to sunny and sunny was saying how his like his ratty stuff it made them change the way cloud and i was playing just to deal mm -hmm. with this one guy which is awesome shanks even if he was having a, a little bit of a more underwhelming tournament than he normally does, was still looking until phenomenal he, when he, he needs to be. Yeah, it, he popped <laughs> off when he needed. He saved them in that match in in a big way. Um, and Poised as well was looking good. I mean, the synergy on the team is there. We, we brought yeah. up this story a lot, but it's just like five players who have been playing together for a while. This team has been allowed mm -hmm. to, to just brew and slowly improve their friends. Um, that, that just work together in a fantastic way and i'm so happy for them even even if they don't make it to champs this is still a phenomenal tournament result oh, yeah. because this is putting oh, yeah. people especially for casual fans that, that are just like oh 100 thieves sentinels yay it, it, it puts them on people's maps as, as a team to be respective and that's massive for them uh, like i said earlier them and exit are my big teams going into next year who i'm excited to yeah. watch I, I i believe that as well because even even for for rise you know we saw that tweet from poised that was the first time that he IGL for a team. He's never uh, IGL before. Which is before. crazy, and it, yeah, it looked yeah, so he... good. Like, think about the, the the rounds we saw in that replay versus Hundred Thieves. Like, his yeah. calls were very very strong. <laughs> and it again goes back to the thing where it's like the team has such good synergy. They they work so well to play off of that and adapt in the mid round. I don't know. It, I, I was impressed. Point Poise told me that the uh, the only real experience that he's gone with uh, as an IGL was when he was still with Def and Som and Odorous uh or Odorous sorry with Dignitas so like the the rules that Poise had was like hey Def here are the tendencies here's how this team plays etc cetera, etc cetera. and then Def would had the final call then they get to they get to go uh but going into Rise it's like okay well I now have the responsibility the leadership to call for this team and then adding just Superman into the roster and that synergy that all gels super well I think it makes it a lot easier for him to call and what mm -hmm. I also did like from Poise was that he had a map going specifically into that map too that we mentioned before with Jetta is that he went 0 in like 12 or 0 in 13 in that second map right and he comes back and bounces back and still does a great job uh, on the third map despite them losing. So to show that they have like that 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 strength and that tenacity to be able to come back and to just have fun with it too. Like they lost the second map 0-13 and they're like, the script's been reversed. We're going to follow the script. It's time for us to come back. These guys are having so much fun. And when you're having fun and you're showing these results, I can't wait to see when they're going to put their, their game faces on and be like, look out for us for 2021. So props to Poise, props to Anger on top of that as the as the new coach for rise and uh, speaking about the, the the rise team and the rise fame and how rise has been doing we have a, actually another sot coming in with vanity off the interview of the grand finals but this is on the other end of the spectrum where vanity talks about this 13-0 that they got against rise i really don't think there was that much different like we just stopped throwing like the man advantage rounds like I feel like if you watched our first match against Rise, we probably should have 2-0'd them. Like, our, we were up on Breeze pretty convincingly, and then they won some rounds in overtime. And then the two rounds they won in overtime, one of them was a 4k by Superman running through a Viper Wall. The other one was Shanks, because his teammate lagged out. He just took aim duels and one top five people, right? It's like, I feel like those rounds are hard to replicate, and uh, I think we were pretty good at shutting them down today. 
definitely. So while uh, Vanity comes here and continues to talk uh, about, uh, you know, his, his tenure with a team, how good he's feeling, let's check out this tweet that says, it's basically a meme. <laughs> so... You know, Vanity Chat, he's the type of person that likes to put this these shit posts being like a being like I think Mimi inspires from Vanity pretty much. So goes across here as was a Vanity fan while he was on version one, blah, 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 blah. And then he uh, just continues with the memes and you just got a bunch of people that just tweeting right after. But it shows like that. I think he takes it to he's a very competitive guy. I think Vanity is yeah. a, a great dude uh, and, and a super nice guy to talk to and very fun to hang out with. Uh, but when it comes down to like competitive side of it, if you're going to try to talk shit to him, he's going to bring it back. Because you saw the other shit tweets that he put out about, uh, was it Coldamenta or something like that? Of, uh, when, when, the, when he goes into the, the clown in the back in Berlin on the forehead because he was told that you better just tattoo Iceland on your forehead because that's the biggest <laughs> team you'll ever get. And then suddenly, Vanity IGLs two different teams with less time, less experience with the roster that he's played with and brought version one to Iceland now brings Cloud9 to uh, Berlin. There it is. And now you're just thinking at this point, Vanity could potentially be one of the best IGLs in this game, including also one of the best controllers in North America. Pretty nuts. Actually, like, it's incredibly nuts to meet a player like that who can just lift up a team. It's something that you don't get to see all too often. I think even in the CS days, it is hard to think of 10 IGLs who have that sort of flexibility and depth that you can just pick them up, make a top-tier team. Even look at Existence, right? Coming over to Valor and jumping onto NIP. What have they yep. done? You know, like, it's it's a damn tough task, and that's with some really solid players backing them. So to do it twice in a row, I mean, it's a shame they're just going to get shit on by EMEA this time around. <laughs> Fuck you. Blah, 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 blah. The, the, the <laughs> grind, you know? The hustle. <laughs> Yeah, Vanity, oh boy. Vanity as an individual, I think he just instantly adds to any team just because yeah. he's mid running. I mean, when we were listening to that interview as well, if he has a good coach behind him who can help with the strategic out of game stuff, and then he can just micro the shit out of the in game, it it just looks fantastic. I think he was, um, to, to be honest, I think he was one of, if not the biggest reason that, that they were able to make it to Iceland. I don't think without Vanity, mm -hmm. Vanity of a different IGL, I don't think version one makes it. We saw it here, right? It's the same core, no Vanity team looked. Yeah. Really bad this event. Yep. Yep. Especially like it was Mitch Ben, the, or not Mitch Ben, just Mitch, period. The last one that tried to IGL for the team. And, and it didn't look too great because too it Mitches. actually. I know, right? It uh. took away from Mitch's uh, ability to be able to just frag out while he was IGLing too, because he tried out to play on Astra at yeah. some maps too, but it didn't work out. But that's it. That's C9 moving forward to champions. We're wishing them all the best, of course, uh, onto the champion stage. Uh, naturally, oh. very easy. Uh, we'll have in non, no particular order. We will have Sentinels, Envy, and Cloud9 as a top three going out of champion. So that's fucking awesome. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and, and get back to what we're usually used to here on Valoranting because I'm too nice. Mitch Ben's the one that actually feeds <laughs> off the toxicity of, of Uber when he actually rants out. And it's actually time to rant because sometimes, you know, we have some good journalism. Sometimes they kind of fuck up. That's what we call it here in the runner show. It's the upcomer fuck up so let's talk about this article let's talk about the background of what's going on here with uh with cned and and this misleading title into the article but uh before we get into the article in itself let's give a background as to how we got into this storyline here um so i'll start it off to, to with it and then you guys can fill in to see if i'm missing some points um but basically what 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 was happening is that you had this dude uh, he's been stealing credit cards or knows people that's been stealing credit cards over there in Turkey. Uh, and they've started approaching streamers, pro players, and, and just any type of streamers and say, look, listen, uh, we're going to be donating you some bits uh, with these credit cards. And then once you get and, and they're like microtransactions pretty much. So it's never going to be spotted by Twitch. Uh, so whenever you get the payments coming out from Twitch, take out that money and we split it 50-50. So you're basically money laundering at this point. And I think where you had like this huge question mark, like what the fuck's going on in this in this region was when we actually had the payments uh, from Twitch that were leaked with the top, the top whatever uh, people that were get, getting money off Twitch donations and Twitch subscriptions, actually, more specifically. Um, then you're starting to notice like these small time streamers with like 20, 25 viewers still getting a huge payout 
Mm-hmm. And, and then you started doing a little bit of research and you realize that there's money laundering going on and it's been reported <laughs> to uh, the parliament over in Turkey. So now there's apparently like up to like, what, 300 people that are that are like yeah. uh, that are mixed in this shit. And it now leads us to this article where from Upcomer uh, entitled it that CNET admits being a midst of uh, of the laundering scandal and <sighs> the title being misleading. I think at this point, first off, if I've missed anything, uh, Mitch, man, if not, go off, King. No, I think that I think you've you've covered everything. The first thing I'll say is just real quick, kind of fucking hilarious that uh, Twitch had that data for so long and never noticed, but uh, yeah. <clears throat> definitely didn't choose not to notice the money laundering there. But anyways, um, Valor and Pro <laughs> CNET admits involvement in Twitch money laundering scandal. I saw that title and I was like, CNET, you fucking idiot. There's no shot this man would like a huge career ahead of him a shit ton of money coming in off twitch gotten involved in some fucking make quick cash scheme like that that really pissed me off and then i read the article and i was like oh okay so what actually happened was cnet said on the stream that he was he had received bits from that person that person had never contacted him said they had talked with his older brother but that's kind of where it ends basically from what i get He received the bits, he didn't report them to Twitch, but he kept them, and that's that. Now, the thing is, what he did was receive bits. He admitted that on the stream. That's all that Mm -hmm. was said. The problem here is not, and I've seen a lot of people argue this, like, well, he was involved in the scandal. Yeah, sure. What is written in that title is technically correct. It is legally airtight. I don't imagine they'll get sued for that because he was involved in the scandal in some way but the way they've said it that he admits involvement it makes it sound and the way everybody read it instantly was like this motherfucker had gone to this guy and be like yo you got any credit cards handy yeah i uh, got a couple free bits off you that's fucking insane they have literally taken it because i saw the comments man i was scrolling through this in the first couple seconds it goes up and so many of the comments because you know how people work man people don't read articles they see titles they respond they share they do whatever 90 percent of people guaranteed didn't click on the fucking link and they knew that upcomer yep. as a journalism system knew that when they put out this fucking title that was going to get people to click that was going to get people involved and if not that it'll get them sharing it it'll get them interacting with it. it'll get those numbers up that's fucking disgusting to use a player with a bright future and just smear his fucking name like that where there's going to be people now for for quite a while with a sour taste there could be it could be a sponsor thinking about signing a send, looks up CNET, sees that article, goes, oh, money laundering scandal, fuck that, yeah. and is out of there. Why? Because some dude donated bits to him. Now, listen, there's a world where this turns around in the next three months and it goes, oh, CNET was actually the bloke with the credit cards. You never fucking know. But the reality is, in this moment, with the information we had and with what CNET admitted out loud, which was just that a dude had donated to him, that's basically all he said, to turn around and write an article like that knowing exactly like with it's not that it just so happens to be written that way they've written it with the intention of sparking controversy and getting this guy's name dragged through the mud just so they can get a few fucking clicks on their shit tier website where they publish things like for example a couple days ago copenhagen flames out of the major out of yeah they're out of the ma- no they fucking weren't they just lost a match and they were like oh this is the end of copenhagen flames like, they're putting out articles that are just fundamentally fucking wrong. They're clickbaiting. Like, what the fuck is this platform? I've personally never used Upcomer, but holy shit, I don't think I fucking will be after this. It's insane. Honestly, blew my mind. Just to see so little respect put on a player's name like that. So just just to add a bit, too, on the uh, on the storyline between with uh, with Cena uh, admitting things onto, uh, hmm. onto a stream, and props to uh, one Rusted Silver to in chat right now that reminded me of this, too, is that the the issue that happened with a lot of these streamers too is that this person that is also uh, throwing out all these credit cards or, or or having these deals with these streamers or whatnot was also saying was also threatening these streamers to a point of like you were kind of like stuck in there because if you were gonna at some point say no I don't want to be a part of this shit anymore or like this is wrong or whatnot the apparently the guy was just saying look you better be you better stick to the plan and 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 respect this uh your your part of the bargain because if not i'm just gonna keep pumping some some donations and some bits into your stream until you actually get fucking flagged and then you get your account permanently suspended or get in trouble with twitch so that it gets flagged out so uh, again you're 
some some people like let's say myself will say well fuck it go ahead i don't give a fuck i'll just tell the truth and see what happens after mm. but then you're you're dealing with hmm. a, a lot of like younger generations new time streamers mm -hmm. that you know you, they, that. they don't know like how things are going now it's like holy shit i'm threatened i'm tied down so i might i might as well just like go on with it if not i'm gonna get in trouble but you're gonna get never, in trouble either way and never mind the younger streamers and stuff man how hard is it to communicate with twitch Can you imagine what the process is like to turn around and be like hey by the way this guy's he sent me bits and it's illegal when there's threat cards. there's threat man it, it could have gone from like me it, it could have been anywhere from like it starts off with the guy saying i'm gonna keep donating until shit happens but it could probably escalate to a point with like certain threats where you know now you're feeling mm -hmm. even more in danger that you want you don't want to whistleblow or anything like that too right there there are there are yeah. those those things that could happen These people so know exactly how to push your buttons and make you act like exactly it. there is you'll catch yourself doing it all the time right where you behave in a certain way purely because of how the other person has like whether you're like oh sorry or so it's like a guttural reaction these people know how to mm -hmm. fucking play on that and get you to to play their games get the get the money out of you it's it's their fucking profession as scummy as it is so but it, look all that aside obviously there's a lot of gray areas and stuff here the thing that just really pissed me off was how they weaponized a very mm -hmm. unfortunate situation that this guy was in that he had the balls to come out and talk about on twitch and then you know all of a sudden these guys are are using it to try and attack him and, and it's like i'm sure the person who wrote it didn't think about it like that the article itself by the way fine i didn't have an issue with the article it's, it's purely the title whoever wrote that fuck you um they uh i i i think it was a lack of thought put into it mm -hmm. yeah. it was like we want clicks go for it and they didn't fully realize the implications of what they were saying of how it would read to a random viewer i think to some degree they did realize that which is obviously why they've done it but you know sometimes people are a little irresponsible but all, add in all the shit that I started to hear about Upcomer and their articles and their journalistic processes, it was just like, it sounds like a pretty shitty organization, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I even think personally, like, you know, from the people that are working within Upcomer, you have some great, uh, at least for me, I still find that I have yeah. some great uh, people that work within there, like Yinsu in general. I hate uh, Yinsu. Like, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, you have Yinsu, Declan, um, you have Fion. Um, oh, yeah, a bunch of good guys. Like, all, all good homies for, uh, of ours or whatnot. But I, I do understand, like, even for me, from an entertainer's perspective, like, when I do analyst desk or when I try to do uh, XYZ in terms of talking about a team or talking about a player, I also have to make sure that I do my due diligence that I don't defame their image sure. for the sake of entertainment, which is why... I'm usually that type of person that's like, oh, Vensley is too nice and, and stuff like that too. But I do understand that, you know, as much as I'm making a career and putting food on the table, these pro players are doing the same thing as well. They're just trying to play the fucking game, compete, and put food on the table as well and, and, and make a living out of being a professional player. So if I'm going to be a person that's going to hinder or, or damage their image on just, uh, on just sensationalism, sensationalism, it's not worth it uh, in my eyes. And I think definitely uh, that should have been looked upon and corrected uh, when we were looking at trying to pump out the title. Because again, the article makes sense. Uh, everything is factual in there. It's just a misleading title where unfortunately it could have been a little bit better. Also, just please, please just fucking read an article before you share it and you retweet it and all that shit. Just, just fucking read an article. Don't it trust never headlines. Happen to me. People, people, <laughs> jur journalists aren't fucking infallible. People write dumbass shit. They want your clicks. They want your impressions. And they do that with awful, awful titles like this mm -hmm. one. So just please be careful. It's not just in esports. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's it. it it's just uh, sensationalism journalism, right? So it's, uh, it's like a TMZ kind of thing at this point. Yeah. And do you want to be a TMZ? Valorant or do you want to be a tabloid time. Exactly. Oh or do you want to be a respected, uh, a respected CNET tabloid? CNET said, so. what? <laughs> <laughs> you won't believe how much money CNET might have stolen. Pretty much. Pretty might much. have stolen. Mark, like, what the fuck? Yeah, no. So, yeah, uh, unlucky at that point. But, you know, we'll, we'll rest it there. And, and hopefully in the future in terms of uh, the way that we want to uh, process this information. Because so far, at least, as you mentioned here, Mitch, uh, it's still going to be uh, CNET in the clear. Nothing should happen there. I even think like even that, like even the Japanese, like I was looking at my Twitter feed, the Japanese retweeted that. And then I looked at the translation and it said like CNET involved in scandal, now afraid of being banned from champions, blah, blah, blah. blah. And then the tweet right after it's like, correction, blah, 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 blah. So it's like, 
read the article make sure you check that out and at the same time make sure that we don't uh fuck over our our peers uh images in, in the process so uh so with that we we close up here into into this loop of this scandal uh we'll see how it's going to develop uh, later on because i'm pretty sure you know despite all this upcomer are still doing a a, a good job in terms of reporting into this and getting more details such as it comes nice along guy. so you're just such a nice guy um, it, there know. can't be it can't be anything that's like these guys fucked up, but but they are really nice people, and the weather's really good where they are, so they'll have some beers with their. Family I mean, Upcom is just a beautiful website. I be I love Upcom. Yes, I love end, it. In the end, if the job, if their job is know, like, I, don't use it. I, I always talk about putting food on the table. If their job is to create sensationalism and to do this type of reports, and that you know, what pays about them, whatever, food, dude. Well, it is I food. think Cena has plenty of food. Let's be honest. He has well, some, we he has some it's delicious Cena. bits Cena to has eat. plenty of food, but if he got oh, fucked take tomorrow, or even though, fucked today of because that. of that. But oh, what no, I'm saying we... is, I'm pretty sure, like, <laughs> if you actually do have a one-on-one -on -one with these people outside of their jobs, you know, some people are all different. You know, sometimes you have to put a face for Ooh, everything or whatnot. Be less so. nice. Some Anyways, let's go on to... Some people are bands, and sometimes you got to deal with them, too. So, I mean, that's what I mean. It is what it is. It is what it is. Chat's like we, we want to pay to see Vans go off on something. Uh, I, I want we'll Vans to see Vans someone in, like out. a bar fight. I want to see someone yeah. like crack a bottle on Vans just to see what you he know, does. Just turn I've around. Never, and go, I've never gone to a fight ever in my life. <laughs> that doesn't surprise. Neither have I. I'm not a very confrontational person, Vans. Well, maybe you, you two can fight. You can both. Can if, if you guys get to do champs, first fight for both of you. There you go. Yeah. Start strong. Wow, that was a really good right hook, Vans. You're <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're excellent, Vans. Dude, you, you must have cracked my teeth. Damn, oh my son. god one day we'll see one day we'll, one day we'll see if somebody could actually push my buttons but mimi it's now uh 115 do you have to go do you have to do nsg i have to dip i have to go cast some some nerd street gamers uh what is it winter champs uh, qualifiers so uh thank Already you for having me it's been fun no, look, as fun. always to get to chat with about things uh hopefully the quick the clip of the week is good yeah, yeah, exactly. It's Mimi, thanks so much for coming on. As usual, hopefully, hopefully you're going to be able to come back for some more. Hopefully you for come sure. back from uh, from quitting Valorant and uh, stop crab games sometimes. I might, I might revisit soon. sometime. Take a little like <laughs> reunion tour. You know what it is. You know what it is. But thanks for having me, gents. I will uh, see you guys soon, I'm sure. Pieces. Well, so now uh, to just finish things off then, uh, we're almost done our show too. But before we close off the show, it's time to go with the clips of the week so of course uh shout out to mimi with uh, with a nice little photo that she left us with uh as, as her departure this is so bad but follow me here on twitter sag middle finger i think that's all love so let's get on to that it's just a normal deal so feel free to let us know if you saw something great and you want us to include later on in the shows because we're going to try to pump a lot more of these out for the clip of the weeks. And then uh, we'll have a poll after we watch these uh, these clips and, and do a reaction. So, of course, feel free to tweet us out at Twitter. Uh, well, on Twitter, at Valoranting, uh, for your, your, your submissions of the clips of the week. So, to start things off, let's go with clip number one. It is going to be the Minu Ace to win the map with a nice little 5K. So, let's have a look at that. This, this was, was so uh, the 10-star in G2. Yeah, it was indeed. It was. This was so sick, man. Ten Star was struggling to close it out for a while, and then Nino just sneaking it up inside of main, hiding behind a box. They knew she was there. They thought she'd gone all the way to spawn, and she was able to get the jump on them, ace out the round. Being kind of a slow map for her as well, so it was huge to get on the board there right at the end. Really uh, got, got our attention, that's for damn sure. What a way to close it. It's a good way to take a, uh, an advantage of misinformation, right, that came out, too. I think you saw a little bit of utility that came out to try to ping her out and didn't. And she did the upper hand and got that beautiful ace there to eventually have 10-star beat versus uh, beat G2, sorry, in the Game Changer Season uh, Series 2. So clip number two, we have Kusta with a nice little 4K and a, a little special kill in the end. So let's let's have a look at that. We'll try to roll that again for a second time. Third time's a charm. So it's actually looking at their matchup in the lower bracket uh, against LG. LG, who we actually didn't have a chance to talk about much here, but unfortunately also uh, fell short in, in the roster, right? We had your boy Drake coming out as a Jet, um, and where I feel that he had a lot of value coming out with, uh, with Arena in previous matches. But you got to try different things. You got to try to put that your boy Drake back on that Jet uh, as they've tried before. <laughs> and a nice little oh, knife kill in the end there from Gusta. Uh, on to Moose. So Genji ends up actually beating LG and also eliminating LG from the last chance qualifiers, which, by the way, rumors are that your boy Dre are, is currently in talks with uh, other other teams for, for next season. And that's reported by who? George Godez of Upcomer. 
Uh, yeah. yeah, so we'll see what happens. We will talk about these uh, these roster changes uh, later on next week. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then let's uh, let's head on over to that clip number three. I think this is probably the best one so far. I don't want to I don't want to skew the votes here, chat. But um, you know, at my age, at thirty seven here, Mitch, man, I don't have TikTok, right? So when okay. this kill actually happened, and I was like, "Holy shit, this fucking happened!" Everybody else that's like twenty and and under. Or like, yeah, I've seen this like 50 oh, times man. in my fucking TikTok scroll. Um, <laughs> I did not know this. So we had I a TikTok knife I have not seen this on my TikTok. Uh, my TikTok <laughs> is not Valorant. Uh, I think I would be in trouble if my TikTok ever got... Not my not my TikTok. I'm not uploading some fucking shirtless photos. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's just the stuff that's recommended for me. Quite uh, dark, let's say. Oh my. Uh, yeah. Love the little knife kills through the the wall because that, that's been such a huge thing recently as well. Like we've seen a bunch of teams do it. Avova, I think, was one of the mm-hmm. better players for just sitting there on the other side, blocking yes. you coming through. And how the fuck do you take that fight? Well, you just stab him. <laughs> so yeah, apparently it's very easy. Literally, the the strat in itself was cosmic divide comes up and you have one on each side and you set the crossfire. And now that you got these knife kills, that's that's gonna change the name of the game. That's gonna change the astral walls going into the, the next tournament. So, chat, let us know your thoughts. We got a minute to put the votes in, so all you got to do is go into the Twitch chat at twitch.tv forward slash dnpeak and type in number one, two, or three uh, to see uh, who is going to be our final victory with that. So, uh, Mitch, man, as as we got the votes going in, any type of uh, anything going on that really gave you a a, a different highlight throughout the whole week here in the Valorant scene? Oh, dude, I'm I'm thick as shit, so I, I can't remember anything that happened this week versus any other week. I was just thinking, honestly, when that matchup came up for Kusta's uh, play, did you have the bracket up in front of you, or did you, like, legit remember, oh, this was the lower bracket match? Because, like, it always amazes me with you. I feel like we, we sit here and someone's like, and I remember it, ESG VYC 2013. <laughs> I was playing this, and some guy did a no scope, and you're like, "Oh, on Dust Two down low." I'm like, "What the fuck? <laughs> How do you remember this? I have to have my notes in front of me, or I just fall to shit." Like, I watch vods. Uh, you watch vods. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> because honestly, dude, even when I like watch a whole fight, even when I cast a tournament, and then someone's like, "Those games yesterday, right? That first game on Bind," and I'm like, "Hold on, whoa, we're going too fast." I mean, <laughs> Bind. Okay. Honestly, Ooh, mix well. Like, I'm like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Uh, honestly, I actually, I, it does happen to me too. I feel like uh, Will Ferrell in old school. You know when he gives a speech on the on the podium and he talks about like graduating and all that stuff too, and then it just finishes. Oh, yeah, and yeah. He shakes his head. It's like I just blanked out. What the fuck happened? That does actually <laughs> happen to me when I'm casting, and then uh, and then I I need to like just have a little reminder after that. But then the Gen yeah. G LG, I was like, oh, okay, so this happened in the bracket. This happened in the bracket. So then I actually just pulled it up, and I'm happy I was right. I just guessed Yo, it out too. At whenever point, we're so. at a land together, dude, I'm gonna make a little show, and it's gonna be like pulling up a random Masters event, like, and it would have to either be international or North America, right? I couldn't just yeah. be like, here's Russia, good luck. <laughs> um, but like. And just get you to make remake the whole bracket exactly as it happened. Oh my okay, god! Let's put in exact series scores. I think you'd be like, you'd be. I don't think I'm gonna do You'd it. be able to do a good you job. Think so? I the think you'd be like in there, the top two percent of people. It. Don't don't yeah. make me guess the whole bracket, but like. No, no, we'll do like the first matches and then be like, okay. now show us how it unfolded. And I think like I'd give like eighty percent odds on every match that you'd get it right. If, as we if go we, through. If we actually get champions together in Berlin, let, let's try that out. Let's after, do it. Uh, let's after do a it. couple of drinks together, too. That'll be, that'll be pretty fun. <laughs> so <laughs> Before a couple of drinks, I'm going to fuck it up. <laughs> so, so with that, we actually want to congratulate that clip number three was Vanity with the knife kill and that clutch on a 2K uh, to be able to win that, uh, that clip of the week and also eventually win the series here with Cloud9, uh, the victors of the LCQ NA. Of course, you saw here, chat. I had to put in a number two because uh, I have to support my homie Kusta. So somebody had to put a vote in that. So I, I, I gave a little bit of love to uh, to Jinji and to Kusta. But with that, as Mimi continues to do this to us, we also want to say thank you so much for tuning in. Mitch, uh, so you're flying in when for uh, for Homegrown? Uh, in about 12 hours. So. Oh, shit. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. So we'll get you prepped up for that. We'll let you do your suitcases. I'm pretty sure you do your laundry and you want to pet your dog a little bit more before you leave for another week. But oh, yeah. I'm actually looking forward for the tournament. This is a, this is going to be very fun. Hopefully Fracture is in there and we get to yes. watch a bit because 
uh, the homegrown, if I'm not mistaken, or the homegrown, home sorry, uh, was, a, was a really nice format that they had going on to that one. Uh, so pay attention to there to the Red Bull Twitch uh, so you could actually check out the rule set and how the event will pan out. But there's a lot of those top teams in Europe that, uh, that are going to be there. So Mitch, safe travels. Hopefully you have fun you. in the week. For myself, there's nothing going on. Finally, after three weeks, we could take a little break uh, until we figure out uh, the next event, which I can't announce yet, but we got an event coming up that I'll be casting too. So I'm looking Ooh. forward to that. Uh, but for today, episode number 74, thank you so much to all of our guests, uh, Mimi, for coming back onto the show, Jess the Goat on Twitter to join us and talk about the Game Changer series number two, and of course, Volkswagen Jetta of Cloud9 Blue to come in to talk about the victory of Cloud9, and congratulations to C9 Blue to make it to the grand finals to win and to also be our third team to represent North America in the champion stage. Uh, and with that, make sure you follow us on social media at Twitter. It's going to be at Valoranting, youtube.com forward slash Valoranting, and give a follow right here on twitch.tv forward slash DNPeak. So for Mitch Ben, Mimi, and myself, we wish you a good day, good night, and see you next week. <laughs>